unmuted. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. <coughs> and welcome to Tampa City Council, held this day on April 20th, 2023. Councilman Carlson, I believe you have uh, the invocation. Yes, good morning. I have um, Nicole from um, Presbyterian Church in South Tampa, and um, she's a native of Florida, graduated with a bachelor's in English from Stetson University and with a master's of divinity, master of arts in Christian education from Uni uh, Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, and just recently got a doctorate of ministry from Emory. Uh, Nicole was ordained as a teaching elder, uh, minister of word and sacrament in 2004. She served as associate pastor for um, Christian education at St. Charles Avenue Presbyterian Church in New Orleans uh, for two years prior to coming to Palmasia Presbyterian Church in 2006, where her ministry focuses pastoral care and worship. Uh, since moving to Tampa, Nicole met and married um, Christopher Abner. They have three children. When not at church, they can often be seen uh, biking to Jerry Joy, which uh, a lot of us have gone to in between holding signs across the street. 
Um, but thank you. Your church has a great reputation. It's been growing fast and um, is, is, a, is a real highlight of the community. So thank you so much for coming this morning. We can please rise. We thank you for the gift of community and ask your blessing to be upon the city of Tampa and the communities within which we live. Help us all to be good stewards of the vast resources of this corner of the earth. May honest industry and sound learning mark our communal life, that together we will be a public witness of the value and treasure found in community. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. As this council begins their business, we stop and pray for all those who hold office in the government of this city, that they may do their work in a spirit of wisdom, kindness, and justice. Help them to use their authority to serve faithfully and to promote the general welfare of the people. Infuse the council with passion and imagination and give to them the wisdom to balance compassion and challenge. Guide each of us, O oh God, to be good citizens of this city and nation helping us to respect neighbors whose views differ from ours so that without partisan anger, we may work out issues that divide us in order to serve the common good. And now glory be to the one whose call to justice always stands and all praise be to the one whose love is steadfast. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Carlson? Here. Vieira? Here. Maniscalco? Here. Hertek? Here. Goose? Here. Miranda? Here. And Citro? I am here as well. We have a physical call. Council members, if you will please indulge me for uh, just a few minutes. Uh, Miss Molly Beeble. We have. Most of you know Ms. Beeble as from the uh, Mayor's Youth Corps, but she is not here representing the Mayor's Youth Corps today. She's wearing a different hat. And she had asked council if we would not mind the students from Sun Lake Academy of Math and Science to be here today so they could find out more about local government and to see what we do here at City Council. So if you do not mind, council members, I would like to have them come up, introduce themselves, and tell us what grade they are in. Ms. Beeble. Mr. Goods, are, are, we, are we cool? You're the chairman, okay. sir. I'm, Thank you. This is your show. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chairman Beeble. Citro. Thank you, and good morning, Council. Thanks for having us. I'm not going to take any more time. I'll just let the students come up and speak for themselves. Well, first, I'll pass it off to their teacher, Mr. Holler. Thank you. Hey, my name is Matthew Haller. I'm a middle school social studies teacher, and I run the student government for Sun Lake Academy. I'm a little biased. This is probably the smartest uh, group of kids that you've seen in all of middle school in the U.S. And so, but I think you should uh, get to know a little bit about them. So if you guys want to come up, say your name and grade. Hi, I'm Shreya Saram, and I'm in eighth grade. Hi, I'm Leila Samaya, and I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Cadence Fernandez, and I'm in sixth grade. Hello, I'm Ishan Visabnivisu, and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Sienna Martin, and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Anjali Koth, and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Lillian Carpenter, and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Sienna Domhoff, and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Aya Lubani, and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Claudia Bergen, and I'm in seventh grade. And this is Councilman Miranda's new Hi. intern for a day. <laughs> I have a second intern in a minute. <laughs> yes? Uh, I'm Guillermo Manara, and I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Andrew Tucker, I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Olivia Matika, and I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Isaac Martinez, and I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Hudson, and I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Noah Floyd, and I'm in sixth grade. 
Hi, I'm Alice King, and I'm in sixth grade. I want to thank you all very much for being here today. The old saying that youth is our future, I, I believe, no, youth is our here and right now. And Mr. Beaver, thank you for bringing them in. And I hope that you will take away something today that you are going to learn about local government, how it works, how it runs, and the decisions that we make. Again, thank you all for being here today. All right, I will entertain a motion for adopting the minutes of April 11th and April 13th. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. aye. Is there any opposed? Motion passes. Shall we go through the agenda and addendum? All right, let's, let's start with, uh, excuse me, staff reports. Uh, I'm coming, I'm here. Our 130 public hearing review, I, we can't to open that now, but I believe that is going to be continued. That's my understanding. It will be a request to continue that item. That number again, Madam Clerk, is number 67. So Not no, got to do it at one But just, just, just so that those who are monitoring the, the hearing, that there will be a request for to continue the 130 public hearing. And I believe uh, uh, administrative updates, uh, Chief Bennett will not be here. However, uh, Ms. Jean Duncan has been asked to fill in for that administrative update. Agenda item number 69, I believe that is also going to stay on the agenda. Yes. File number, uh, excuse me, number 70, it's that is also, they're going to be heard together. 71, we got a memo from Abby Feely on that. <coughs> that is also staying. Number 72, Councilman Vieira. Um, you know, I'm fine with the written report. We can talk about it, but that's fine. Okay, so we'll leave it on the agenda. Yeah, but no, no appearance is necessary by Tampa Police. Thank you, Councilman. We have agenda item number 73. Councilman Carlson. Yes, sir. Um, I, I read the staff report. Could we just continue this um, for six months just so we can get an update? Second. Could we have a date, please? I need a date, yeah. Could we have a date? Um, how about... Okay, perfect. October 5th. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> motion passes. Agenda item number 74. Um, <clears throat> if I may, uh, sir, I'm, I'm fine with a report. I'll talk about it and make a motion for this to come back uh, for us, but I don't need staff here. Thank you. Agenda item number 75, Councilman Carlson. Uh, yes, please. I read, we read the report, but it would be good to, ha to this, just have a short discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Agenda item number 76. Absolutely, please. I'd like to uh, do the presentation. So, of course, yes, I want folks here. Thank you. Agenda item number 77, Councilman Goods. Yes. 78, Councilman Carlson. Uh, yes, we, I think we're going to uh, vote on that. Um, yes, there is a resolution to that. Uh, 79, Councilman Carlson. That, uh, I'd like to make a motion to remove 79 Second. from the agenda. We have a motion by Councilman Carlson to remove agenda item number 79, file number CM23-81300, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion passes. Agenda number 80, Councilman Goods. Yes. And then we have 81 and 82 that I believe are being uh, requested to continue until April 27th. 27. So moved on 81 and 82 to continue the next Thursday, April 27. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, agenda items number 81, CM23-80244, and agenda item number 82, CM23-79913, be continued to April 27th, 2023. Move to continue item 83 to May 25th, 2023. Second. Uh, excuse me, on 81 and 82. You made that motion. Who seconded that motion, 81 and 82? Uh, Councilman Miranda, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Both uh, both motions passed. Uh, agenda item number 83, Councilman Maniscalco. Move to continue Second. to um, May 25th, 2023 as requested. Second. Uh, and that 
was agenda item number 83. Okay. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in Here. favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And I believe agenda uh, item number 84 has been asked to be continued to August 24th. Continue item 84 to August 24, 2023. We have a motion to continue agenda item number 84, CM 2169890 to August 24th by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Move to approve the agenda and the addendum. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco to approve the agenda and addendum. Seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Council. File number, uh, excuse me, agenda item number one, file number CM 2380349, Councilman Vieira. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have here. And, and if you want, your group can come up if yeah, you want. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning and talk to everybody here. Um, I, I wanted to introduce to City Council and, and to just much of the City of Tampa. You all may have seen these wonderful folks in the news. Um, we have here uh, Mr. Greg Jones, who's an attorney and partner with a law firm, Reliant and Alvarez. Uh, he's board certified in civil uh, trial law and is a very well-known and respected attorney here in the uh, Tampa area. Uh, Mr. Jones serves in many capacities, uh, including being here today, but I think a capacity that I have to mention that probably informs this capacity that he's here for is he's also a deacon at the uh, Bayshore Baptist Church, where he's also on the missions committee. Um, Greg, uh, Mr. Jones launched a nonprofit organization uh, by the name of CUP, which is Coffee Uniting People. Uh, Coffee Uniting People offers all-inclusive coffee shops and employs people of all abilities, including persons with intellectual disabilities, autism, and different uh, physical and intellectual challenges. Uh, Mr. Jones and his team who's here does this for a lot of different reasons, including the fact that about four out of five people with intellectual disabilities are underemployed and unemployed. Um, he also does it to set an example uh, for different entities in the private sector as well as in the public sector, something we'll be dealing with today, in fact, in the city of Tampa, to make sure that different entities are inclusive in their hiring practices and hiring people uh, with special needs and, and intellectual disabilities. And he also does it, and his group that's here does it for a larger principle, which is the idea that we all belong, that no matter who we are, where we come from, what our abilities are, that we're all entitled to respect and dignity. Um, so I wanted uh, Mr. Jones and his team to come here and talk about the wonderful work that they do uh, through CUP because I'll be motioning at the end of Tampa City Council uh, to have the City of Tampa partner with this great group to have them outside um, on, on city property selling their coffee to folks uh, to further spread their wonderful uh, message. So, Greg, take it, buddy. Thank you, Councilman. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us and thank you for those kind words. Uh, I want to introduce my team here. This is actually part of our team. Um, this is uh, uh, Jane Leveroni, excuse me. And this is Ellie Brown, one of our first employees, Lumpy Leveroni, who's also on our board, and my wife, Laura, who's a board member, and Lori Hunt, who's also on our board, and Lori's son, Henry, who's probably one of the reasons why we started this organization. So um, it's not just me by any stretch of the imagination. This is a group. It takes a team effort. We're all rowing the boat in the same direction, so we say. So we uh, started an organization called CUP, which is a nonprofit. We opened up our first shop just down the street at Embar Collective. Um, which is a great building, come down and see us on the corner of Whiting and Jefferson Street. Uh, and I think we are the first inclusive coffee house in Tampa. Hopefully more to come. We want to be the Starbucks of special needs coffee houses. Uh, we are employing individuals, as Councilman told us, of all abilities, um, uh, and, and mainly those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but we're, we're open to all. We've got great plans. Our goal is to uh, spread knowledge about the inclusive disability community in Tampa, uh, and we're excited about this opportunity. I also wanted to recognize um, Phyllis Gutman, who's here also um, from McDonald's Training Center. She's been one of our partners, and Phyllis has uh, been with us also for some period of time. So we're just tremendously excited. We welcome the opportunity that uh, Council Mavira has given to us possibly about selling some coffee out in front of the uh, City Hall here. We've got plans to 
open up our second location on South Del Mabry and El Prado um, in June. So Joe, you'll hopefully be able to stop by. Uh, and we've got some plans to go elsewhere in Tampa down the road, and we've just got big plans to, uh, to uh, develop and explore and expand our mission. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I know you guys have long meetings and you've got to be caffeinated, so we bring gifts. Uh, so I don't know who to give this to. I'll give this to you, Louis, sure, if you don't mind. Or yeah. Pass it up here. We've got Very kind. some coffee bags for each of you. Uh, from Cup, and there you go. And hope you can brew those and enjoy our, our Joe and come by and see us sometime over at Embark Collective Center. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. sir. And, 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 if I, and anybody else, uh, Greg, want to speak? Or everybody? Anybody? Want to speak, no, my name? You sure. Okay, great. Um, so I, I also wanted to present, if I may, a Tampa City Council commendation to you guys for all the wonderful work that you have done and that you will continue to do. Uh, you know, Greg, my head is always off to you. I think you're one of those attorneys uh, who takes on public service. In many ways, we, we see so many attorneys who have done that in Hillsborough County. Sam Gibbons, Jim Davis, Lance Scriven, and so many others. And you certainly are one of those champions So for you guys. So wow. God bless you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you for all that you do. Um, we appreciate you very much. Thank you, Councilman Vieira, for bringing these great folks here. You said Del Mabry and El Prado. Is it the, the vacant corner building there or somewhere else? So if you're familiar with the area, there's a pinch of penny on the yeah. uh, northeast corner. And actually, we're just the next block up between Vasconia and Sevilla. There's okay. a white building, and we will be uh, in there hopefully by the end of June. So it's just actually one block north of Del Mabry and El Prado. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, all right, great. Councilman Wan Hertag. Um, I just want to say thank you already. I'm a little more awake because this smell is amazing. Um, but thank you so much. This is a this is a fabulous uh, program, a wonderful idea, and I believe you're having a fundraiser Friday night. So we are uh, tomorrow night um, over at Beef O'Brady's um, over on MacDill and in um, Beta Bay. So from five to eight beefs, or excuse me, five to closing, beefs is going to donate 20% uh, of all the proceeds uh, to Cup. So uh, anybody has a chance to want to come over and get a hamburger and whatnot, uh, uh, your support will go towards our organization. And to that point, I t the, the support that we have received from the Tampa area community, South Tampa and beyond, has been uh, overwhelming, and that would be an understatement. So we're we're we are extremely fortunate, um, and and. For this opportunity also so tomorrow night at beefs five o'clock yes yes so i just wanted to say thank you again and you all are um doing amazing work and the ability to continue to grow this is phenomenal congratulations um your hard work is certainly noted uh, thank you very much looking forward to seeing you tomorrow night all right awesome Gutsman miranda thank you uh chairman group <coughs> chairman Schaefer. uh it's my honor and pleasure to be here with all you good folks and I see your coffee is uh, made by the Brisk Company. It is. And uh, I had the pleasure of going to school. I didn't know this until I saw the package uh, with the founders of Brisk Coffee way back when we were all little teenagers in high school in Jefferson. But uh, congratulations to you and Brisk for doing what you're doing to give everybody a chance, giving them a leg up, not a push down. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, Denise Reddick at Brisk has been a wonderful partner with us. and. A part of our story is that we've had so many vendors and construction team and members and whatnot who have either donated their services or doing it at a discount uh, for our calls and Denise was there from the get-go so we're very appreciative to have um, Denise and Brisk Coffee with us. They're very nice. Councilman Carlson. Yeah this is a great idea. Um, thank you for all of you for putting this together and please keep us posted on how we can help. Um, and uh, if there are events like the one tomorrow night that we can promote, be sure to send them to us so we can post them and uh, promote them. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, my friend, I've known you for many, many years, and I've learned more about you today <laughs> than I have over the last uh, 15 years. Uh, you're a great person, and this is a great organization that you belong to and with, and helping people that may be overlooked. I thank you for your courage, and I thank you for this wonderful organization. I can't wait to taste some, and it's going to be great. We got a good cafe con leche yeah. <laughs> south of south of uh, uh, Bay to Bay. So thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you all for the hard work that you do. Well, thank you, Chairman.
And next, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, I wanted to invite uh, Mr. Josh Felder, who's here, and we have a uh, film a uh, one-minute snippet, if you will, from a video uh, that uh, was on the Today Show, I think, if IT could play that briefly. Come on, buddy. Didn't we? Oh, yeah, we did. I felt like it was a, one, one of the best summer camps I've ever been to. Give me a high count! When you get a lot of scripts, you are at a place in your career you can pick and choose. What made you want to do this movie? Yeah, I watched the Spanish movie. This is a remake. I watched that. I said, oh, I'm in. It is such a beautiful story, so funny, so brilliant. And then once I met all these guys, the first day, I said, oh, we're, we're going to be in good shape. <laughs> and speaking of good shape, how's Woody's basketball? Is he still playing pretty well? Yeah, he's still good. I always knew he was a good ball player, especially when I saw him in that movie, um, White Man Can't Jump. <laughs> The studio auditioned thousands for the team, looking to hire disabled actors, carefully selecting members of the Friends. Right away, I called my dad and I said, Dad, you would not believe this, I'm in a movie with Woody. He also freaked out when I told him. <laughs> I was shocked. When I started doing a little dance, I was like, I got a role in a Hollywood movie! <laughs> woo! Woo, woo, woo! Kevin, I heard your favorite scene was the karaoke scene. Yes. We had the most amazing time together singing that, that song. I get knocked down, and I get up again. You're never gonna keep me down. I get knocked down, and I get up again. You're never gonna keep me down. The movie is joyful and funny. What's with the boogie board? You do you, I do me, okay? Where do you got this guy? He just showed up and one. They can end it. There you go. Okay, good, I didn't know when. Okay, great, so it's my pleasure to have here. I have Phyllis Guthman here with us from McDonald's Training Center. Uh, who came here for this as well as Cup. Um, and uh, Josh Felder is a very remarkable young man. Um, he's from here in Tampa. He's a graduate of Hillsborough High School um, who grew up here in the Tampa area. As a young, as a young man, uh, Josh was bullied uh, because of, in part, a speech impediment that he had and different challenges. Uh, Josh has a so-called high-functioning autism or Asperger's, if you will. Uh, and his family and his mom and dad always believed in him. Uh, Josh has grown into a, a fine young man who shows the world what he can do when he simply has that opportunity. And boy, what this young man has done is quite remarkable. Before he got to star in a movie with Woody Harrelson uh, and, and numerous other actors, Josh's first brush with fame was in our Super Bowl here in Tampa when he was one of 200 dancers uh, dancing out at the Super Bowl, mimicking moves based on his heroes, uh, Michael Jackson, uh, Chris Brown, Usher, and others. Uh, and for 15 years, Josh has been an ambassador with Best Buddies here in Tampa. That's how we met some years ago. Uh, and he works at Hall in the Night uh, as a staff member there. Uh, and then there's that whole Woody Harrelson thing uh, that happened. So Josh had an opportunity to star in the movie Champions uh, with Woody Harrelson, who, of course, is a real legendary actor. I mean, he's, a, he's an A-lister movies, uh, No Country for Old Men, White Men Can't Jump, uh, War of the Planet of the Apes, uh, Zombieland movies, and, and, and on and on. And it's directed by uh, Bobby Farrelly, the director of Heartbreak Kid, Fever Pitch, and many other movies. It's a movie about an a individual who has a brush with the law and has to coach a uh, Special Olympics basketball team uh, and learns a little something about life. Um, and Josh co-stars in that movie. We're very, very proud of Josh and all the work that he's done uh, in doing this. Again, starring in a movie with Woody Harrelson, you have really become an ambassador for what people can do and, and when given a chance just to fulfill their God-given potential. So for that and so much, my young friend, we give you this Tampa City Council commendation. So here you go, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you want to say something, you know. Thank you for supporting me all my life. Um, if you haven't seen the movie Champions yet, um, not a problem. Um, you can watch it in theaters or you can stream it online. Not a problem. A little bit more. Councilman Miranda. Well, I, I think your shirt says, says it all. You're a champion. Thank you. I mean, you, you jumped over every hurdle that I could jump over, and you certainly made it to the Big Ten <laughs> when you were associated with the movie actors and the, that they were just named Harrison and the rest of them. That's a fantastic thing to do and something that you'll cherish the rest of your life. And I'm sure one day, hopefully, you'll be in the same role that they were when they were in the movie, or maybe even greater aspirations you may have to be a leading star in one of the 
sitcoms or movies or something because you got a head start that most of us don't have a chance to do and you did it only because of your hard work, your determination, and there's a difference between a winner and a loser. And that right. difference is a loser gets up and tries to win. Yeah, and I just never quit. I, not that you were a loser, but I'm saying the difference, I'm making a comparison in life. And I congratulate you for being who you are. Uh, thank you, sir. Guys, for good. Well, congratulations, young man. Uh, I guarantee it was a great experience, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was fun. Um, something that I, I will never forget about. I can just imagine working with, working with Woody Harrelson. So, you know, again, thank you for the... Uh, doing something that other people haven't had a chance to do, probably won't ever get a chance to do, be in a movie. Yeah, so, we, don't, we don't get much actors from Tampa, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got one now, how about that, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you for you too. Got some more hurt, Ty. Congratulations. It is so wonderful to have a great representative from Tampa um, getting out there and showing what uh, this city is all about. So congratulations. I look forward to watching this movie and seeing you in many more. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for the inspiration this morning. What a great way to start the day. Thank you, Councilman Pierre, for, for recognizing this, uh, this young man. Um, this, what, an, what an awesome experience. What a, you know, everything that you've done and you're young and this is just the beginning. So congratulations to you. And again, thank you for inspiring all of us. Thank you for having me. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I think almost everybody Growing up wants to be a movie star, and you've done that. So congratulations. That's um, as Councilmember uh, Miranda said, you're jumping over hurdles that the rest of us couldn't jump over. So congratulations on on achieving what you achieved. Look forward to seeing you in this and others. Thank you, Joshua. You got to hang out with Woody Harrelson. Yeah, I did. Man, man, you know, you are rising so quickly on the ladder of success, and it's because of your hard work and because you want to achieve. But remember, that same ladder, there are people behind you wanting the same type of success. Remember to help them come up that ladder. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to all you've achieved. And keep moving forward, brother. And, uh, yes, sir. And Mr. Chair, if I may, Phyllis, yes. you wanted to say something really Oh, quick? sure. So for congratulations first, Josh. I have to say, if you haven't seen the movie, don't delay. Um, Josh is actually a Tampa influencer for other young people and individuals with disabilities. He's showing everyone what can be done, the possibilities, and I completely agree with you, Chair, that he can help bring others along just by being so visible in the public. The movie is brilliant. I was very pleasantly surprised because it focuses on individuals with disabilities that are adults, they treat them like adults. They're allowed to express themselves as adults with adult language. And it was just a very pleasant surprise to see a well done movie about our community. So thank you, Council and Councilman yeah. Briera for having him. And many congratulations, my friend. Thank you. May I show this on the Elmo, if I may? Here you go. It's Here. already up there. There you go. Yeah, that's the, uh, the poster. And it was funny. I discovered this, I, I was in the movie theater and I'm walking with my son and I see this poster up and I go, that's Josh, what's going on? I had no idea. So it's, it's funny. So uh, thank you, council, thank you. And at this time we will now be taking public comment. If there's anyone in chambers that wish to speak during public comment, please come forward. And if you will, form a line on my left, your right. Remember, you have three minutes. Please state your name for the record. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Greetings. My name is Dominique Cobb. I am a resident and business owner in East Tampa and a multi-generational uh, Tampanian. I am here today because my great-grandfather, Herschel Hatton, was a produce, uh, produce merchant in Ybor City. Also, he paved and laid brickwork down Nebraska Avenue. My great-grandmother, Helen Hughes, also she was the, uh, she upkept the appearance, the homes of politicians on Bayshore Boulevard. My grandmother, Beatrice Cole, 
also helped in the seafood industry. If you lived in Tampa, if you've ate from Singleton, my family was a part of that. Today I come because my grandmother is buried in Memorial Park. Back in January of 2023, that property was sold to a flipper for $18,000, and it was also bid against by the city of Tampa. During my, during my time here, I have volunteered on many boards for the city of Tampa, and as recently of July of 22, we have made a request from city council, historic preservation, and others in the community to assist in purchasing the property of Memorial Park. To my dismay, that was sold under our nose, and we do not know what is going to happen to the final resting place for our loved ones. Today, I come with not so good news because I have a family friend who recently um, suffered a loss, and their grandparents and loved ones are supposed to be pay, uh, buried in that plot. As of now, they are not able to get in touch with the owners, and the funeral home, which is Aikens, all they need is assistance to find out if she can be buried there uh, before the 29th. We have tried reaching out to numerous uh, entities, municipalities. There has been no hope. Uh, as far as the community of East Tampa, that is the heart of Tampa. If you were to do a landscape and scope, that is the heart of Tampa. As you know, District 5 is we are in disrepair. There are housing crises. There are entities that are meant to help us and are abusing their power. We need assistance. Um, and to wrap it up, um, I know I'm only one person, but to everyone in this room, you have a voice, you have power. Use your voice. Go out and vote, write a letter, have someone adv advocate for you. If you do not do that, they will continue to erase the black history that is in Tampa. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Got some good. I did see that email, and I did call uh, one of the family members about that. I talked to Ms. Travis this morning about that in reference to what needs to be done. Uh, you know, you, when, when someone expires, uh, the funeral home, if they're going to be cremated or buried, it's called a burial permit. Everyone gets one. Uh, and I think the issue right now, uh, a funeral, uh, a cemetery never closes. Never closes. They may stop doing burials, but it never closes when you've already purchased a plot in that cemetery. So if a person purchases a plot, they get just like a purchase receipt of that plot. And the family gets that plot, the cemetery, if it's still open or operating, whatever, will have a record of that purchase of the plot. But as far as somebody being buried, cemetery is never closed. A burial permit, so if the funeral happens Saturday, a burial permit goes to the, uh, the, the owners of the, uh, let's just say rest here, for example, before you pull in, they're out there waiting, you give them the burial permit, it's done. Now in this case here, no, it's closed now, so I, I would imagine the funeral home would have to have to get to have the burial permit and then would just give that burial permit to the owners of the new property now. Now, I, I don't I haven't heard about no access. Well, I've driven by that. I, I, I don't see any gates or anything precluding anybody from going in there. And what happens is when you have a cemetery that does not have its own what they call open and closers, that means someone that digs the grave and buries it afterwards. So normally when that happens, when you go out to the country to know the Sasser, we have cemeteries all out there. You have a monumental company uh, will go and they will open and close it for you versus uh, another uh, major company or entity. So I think the key right now is, uh, I think Mr. Travis said you've already been in contact with the owner. I don't think access should be a problem because it's open. I think even uh, what they're running into maybe finding the purchase of the plot. I think that might be the issue, but I don't think it's an issue. I think the owners will probably, since the family has several plots there on that rule, whatever, should be able to just bury the loved one and move on. And then in the future, hopefully, we'll have some resolution resolved moving forward on how these will be done with Memorial Park Cemetery. So that's the information I can give and have. Uh, and again, I think that's what has to happen. It, Ms. Travis says she's already sent a memo to the, the uh, property owner. And I think the funeral home should be able to give the property owner. And I think it can be resolved before the 29th. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Yes, good morning. I would just like to um, address the council and a few words from God, um, the women's Bible, 
did not make everything by my power. The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Pride will ruin people, but those who are humble will be honored. And I would also like to say I would like to thank Ms. Lita Perez of the Minority Enterprise who stuck with me all during COVID-19, getting me uh, through the Minority Enterprise. And I just wanted to thank her for that. And also, we need more um, at the University Center. Um, that My hair and prints are all over that. That was my grad when I was becoming a county commissioner, and I am a bona fide county commissioner, and I work very hard in that community. You can ask Ms. Commissioner Gwen, cause she the one that signed my certificate. And I just been, I had a great day with Councilman Malisalco, and we see the need that's in the community, in my community that I love. And I would just like to say, Thank you, uh, and I'm waiting for the call from Chief Bennett so we can uplift our neighborhood even more like the rest of the great people that are doing great work. We want to make a change in our neighborhood and do great work too. And I thank you for my time, and Mr. Bennett, I am looking for you and waiting for your call, and thank you again, and I love you all very much. Thank you for your patience. Ma'am, can you please give us your name for the record? Sally S.C. E. Lee. Thank you. With the Volunteer Missionary Society Penny Fund, and we need help really, really bad so we can open up and the building that's sitting there empty for five years. And I had a pre-lease on it before COVID, so I'm just waiting for change to come and for God to do what he has to do so that we can become a useful part of the community also with the rest of the good citizens. And we as entrepreneurs, we need the help, all of us. Ms. Connie and all of us, we need help and the volunteer missionary does too. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, good morning. Uh, Jason Marlow here to speak on item number 76. Uh, first off, I wanna thank Councilman Maniscalco for championing this initiative before council. Uh, in a post-pandemic America, we have seen an exponential rise in food insecurity. Uh, millions of people across this country who thought they were insulated from poverty found out they were one accident, one illness, one unemployment, away from having to make really difficult choices between paying bills and being able to afford food on the table. As a former school teacher, I can personally attest to like how useless a student can become on like a diet of soda, hot Takis, and honey buns. Uh, it's vitally important that we increase access to fresh, healthy, locally grown produce in the community. Uh, there are troves of data that exist on the potential diminished outcomes for students that are going to school and leaving school underfed and undernourished. Furthermore, there is a very unfortunate racial component to this. Uh, there's studies that show that, according to the USDA, black and brown families are more than twice as likely to be food insecure than white families. I know East Tampa has been clamoring for a supermarket for eons, and I also know that in today's presentation later that you'll receive, the food deserts that exist within the city of Tampa exist within the communities of color in our city. In 2020, Feeding Tampa Bay estimated 1.3 million people in the region were food insecure. In 2021, the USDA estimated that 10% of Floridian households were food insecure. So this is a real serious issue, but I know that by partnering with both the public sector and the private sector, a little bit of investment, a little bit of love, that we can actually have a positive, lasting impact on this issue. So, so lastly, again, I do want to thank Councilman Menescalco for bringing this forth. I want to thank city staff for the presentation that I'm looking forward to seeing this afternoon. And I want to encourage this body to take a far more active role in investing in the health and well-being of the citizens of the city. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's good to see you all again. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Angela Alderman, the great niece of Francisco Martinez, who's buried within College Hill Cemetery and is among the lost. I am wa I'm wanting to say a few words on the College Hill Cemetery scam. In response to the report that came out this week, I have a few questions and concerns that I would like to address today. <clears throat> this is article number 77. 
There was a scan done February 7th by Artiman and Associates. Paul Guzzo with the Tampa Times reported about this as they were seen scanning the College Hill land. He reached out to the Italian club to discuss and again was ignored. He also spoke briefly with someone from the survey company. I understand from the city of Tampa's legal department and the task force report that the Italian club said they would give a verbal agreement to a scan. I will not praise them for this scan as this should have been done years ago as it is a moral and an honest thing to do. However, I am very happy that this took place. My concerns are in the methodology of the scan. With much due respect to the surveyors who scanned, I spoke with an archaeologist who does such scans to locate lost graves and the methodology to scans. I would like to know what such methods were indeed used on the scan and if they were proper ways to detect the disturbance of the land or the bodies and graves. I request that when the report is available that I can have a copy that I can share with an archaeological company to review the results and confirm the scan. Again, I say this with respect to the surveyors who work hard. It is nothing against them. It's more just about the scan to detect. <clears throat> I would like to add, when the results come in, if there was disturbance of the land or the graves detected in the GPR scan, I would like to request an archaeological survey be conducted. I understand this is private property, but if they were willing to scan, could they not argue this? which is what I asked for originally. Again, it is their property and I respect that, but I stress again the importance of a correct scan. If the result indicates no disturbance of graves, I simply ask where did 1,200 bodies go? There is no question they were laid to rest there. There is no question that is indeed College Hill Cemetery. The maps prove it, the historical paper trail proves it, and the extraordinary research from Paul Guzzo and the Tampa Times. 1,200 graves do not simply disappear. So where are they? I would like the Italian club to show me where the bodies were interred and records indicating where my great uncle was moved to. Next is the time frame of the results. Was there a time frame given for the Italian club to report back the results? I have researched and Zion Cemetery was scanned by Cardno July 2019 and the results were back August 2019. Another example of recent, King High School was scanned by GeoView October 22nd, 2022, and they announced their scans November 19th, a month later. As you can see, the results take around a month or so, and today is April 20th, and they scanned April 7th. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Or do I have a few more? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I am aware of the laws and this being private property, and I've been very patient with the process. But I also have the right to know as a family member of someone buried on the land and 1,200 other souls that have no one to defend them. For them to once rest again in peace and have their dignity restored. I ask where are their rights. I pray that the world learns from this and it never repeats itself. Thank you so much, City Council. I, I have a question for you. Yes. College Hill Cemetery, is it just within the grassy area or, it, or was it also where the existing large mausoleum was at. Yes, it's the existing mausoleum and all the way back. Was College Hill Cemetery. Yes, sir. Because I spoke to a gentleman, I brought this up before, back in 2019, who's since passed away, and he was the architect right. that designed the mausoleum. Right. And the last time I went to his house, I just went to see him, and he started talking about the, uh, the mausoleum. And I, if I remember, he said, you know, when they laid the foundation, that, that they didn't find anything. I don't know. The gentleman has right. passed away, I, you know, and, and his records, everything is, is missing. So I'm curious to know, too, if yeah. 1,200 individuals were moved, you know, where? You know, are, they, are they at Memorial Cemetery? Are they, I mean, that's a, that's a lot. Right, of, uh, records. Yeah. If they were, if there is no detection of bodies, where did they go? Because they, they are proven that they were put there. So. Okay. I, my family, my grandfather never got a notice that his brother was moved, and he lived up until the eight, 1980s, you know, late 80s, 90. He died in 90. So I don't, that's my question if that, that takes place. Again, I'm very grateful that a scan took place. I'm not coming here to, to, to be negative with that because I appreciate counsel and all of your help with this. But you and said it was your uncle, Francisco? It was, it was my great uncle. Your yes. great uncle, and he passed away when? 1917. He 1917, yes. okay. 
Based on the maps, he would have been more than likely buried in the grassy area, which was considered the Cuban cemetery at and that the, time. And the Italian club doesn't have burial records for the cemetery? No. Not, not that they've ever, they've never reached out to me. I've, I've never had anything against speaking with them, but they've never bothered to okay. intervene or anything, so. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Councilman Vieira. Thank you. And, and just, uh, uh, Angela, thank you for your words. And, and uh, obviously, my, my office will connect you with um, uh, the proper individuals for this uh, because you've worked a lot on this. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Bounder Broner. I am the grandson of Johnny Broner, and I am actually the family member that Councilman Goods and Dominique spoke about earlier. I'd like to thank Councilman Goods for contacting me this morning, as well as Nicole Travis, for forwarding my emails to the current owner of Memorial Park Cemetery. I have my family members behind me, my sister Katrina, my aunt Cynthia, and I'm coming here because, as Councilman Goods mentioned earlier, we have an issue locating the records, however, I'm trying to approach this from a civil standpoint, and I would just like the owner to reach out, contact the funeral home, and allow them access because it's a normal part of their business. When John Robinson was alive, he was the last owner of the property. That's exactly what they did. Akins has been passed down from generation to generation. The current owner knows that our family's been buried there for a long time, so we have no issues with the funeral home actually conducting it. It's just the fact that as a part of their business, they reach out to the owner. They say, hey, we'd like to conduct a service on this day. And it's just scheduling the service so that's not in conflict with any other burials. I understand that Councilman Goods mentioned that cemeteries don't close. So from that standpoint, I would like to go off of that in good faith. And I would also allow there some, some grace for human error towards the owner that I'm sure that as a property flipper, he may not have known his rights as a cemetery owner. That being said, Nicole Travis put me in touch with the Florida Department of Funeral Services, Cemeteries, and uh, Consumer Services. So when I reached out to them, they reassured us that a verbal would do. I'm here requesting simply that we can move forward in good faith with that, having simply reached out and informed him that, hey, this is the date that we would like to do it. And knowing that there are no other funerals or burials planned on that day, we could go ahead and proceed. So that's my, my last final request, and hopefully this is uh, resolved well within time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goose. Ms. Travis, uh, if, if the new property owner uh, is not uh, responsive, maybe we can get the Department of Regulations to give him a call so he can be or shoot what the process truly is now and going forward. Uh, and that way we can get this family uh, some comfort for their loved one. I know they're at a stressful point right now in their lives. And if we can kind of comfort them any way we can, I hope that this administration will reach out to them again, like you've done. If they don't respond, get the Department of Regulations to go down there because they will come up very quickly. Trust me, I, I assure you, I know how they operate. Thank you, Councilman Goose. Good morning. Now, I'm Shagret Dawson. I'm a litigant against um, the city of Tampa, two of your former officers and some other public individuals. And I have a couple of cases, but one particularly pending in the Middle District of Florida, where the city of Tampa is named as a defendant in the case number is 22 CV uh, 129. It'll be Dawson versus Holder at all. And I guess the city might need money for other reasons so they get from people asking for public records requests. So anyway, back in 2017, one of your police officers, who happened to be the mayor's head of security, allegedly received a phone call from a local judge requesting that he investigate me. Um, and that investigation wasn't an honest attempt to find any facts sufficient to charge me with felony perjury. It was essentially a legal lynching. And by the way, um, if you don't know, in the state of Florida, a perjury conviction can get you five years in prison, so I wouldn't even be here today. Um, I self-represented, and the case ended when the judge was sent in from another circuit by the Florida Supreme Court. And he dismissed the case after about an hour of time. But it took me disqualifying several judges in seven months of being prosecuted and bouncing from courtroom to courtroom 
and from judge to judge. And throughout this criminal proceeding, I requested documents from the city that I was entitled to as a part of break. So recently I put in a request for that same information and I get this invoice for $10,614.50. And you all, the city, is claiming that somebody needs to uh, put 461 and a half hours toward finding what you should have had when you were prosecuting me. So I don't think anybody in here believes <laughs> that it should take any one person or any combination of people essentially 12 hours a week time, of working time, to give me the information. In fact, you're going to give it to me because I'm entitled to it under Florida law. And you can just go to check out Chapter 119 of the Florida Statutes or Sunshine uh, Act. Plus, our governor has already put on the record that Florida is a law and order state, and I appreciate him doing that. And no one gets to disregard the laws that our legislature has put in place. So I'm here hoping that I can convince you all to get whoever is responsible to get me the information I requested. And I shouldn't have to do some sort of GoFundMe to have the city do what it's supposed to be doing. So I appreciate your time, and hopefully you take me seriously with what I'm asking for. You all take care. Thank you, sir. Mr. Massey, uh, are you familiar with what this gentleman was talking about, sir? Okay. $10,000 is a lot of money for public record. Yes, sir. I'm not familiar with the, the exact item, but under state law, and, and, and we, under our public record, we have a public records uh, office, and we, do, and, we are, and we do charge for staff time if it's for extraordinary requests that re require additional staff time or special uh, uh, special type of uh, services and trying to uh, retrieve all the records. So that that is standard operating procedure and, and, that it, and it, we are allowed to do that under state law. There's cases where that's been challenged before for other municipalities and, and we that the courts have upheld that our ability to charge for those sorts of services. So. If I, if I may. I can't, I, I, I can't let you speak right now, sir. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Massey, I, I, and I understand all those yeah. rules. My concern is the, if there is a public record and police arrested people or did anything to this gentleman from 2017, in my mind, there should be already records held already and I'm not. Exactly. All, all I can do, I do, I'm not familiar with this in particular. All I can do is we will look into it. And Kelly, we'll could you get this gentleman's office. information? Because I don't, I see something wrong here. I, I, a lot wrong here. I understand how, how sometimes, you know, uh, we become victims when you have a certain kind of skin color. I hate to say that, but, uh, say it. you know, the bottom line is I, I, I want to get his information. I'd probably be gone, but I know uh, several colleagues will be here and that needs to be looked into because you can't tell me I was a police officer a long time. They keep records. I know they do. So, so gentlemen, give her, give her you and her name, sir, and hope we can, we can address that. My name is Pastor William, located at 1112 East Scott Street, Campbell, Florida, Paradise Missionary Baptist Church. The reason I keep coming out here because I'm concerned. You know, I live out, out there in East Tampa. Why do they have all those retention ponds in East Tampa when they ought to fill them all up and be a, be a house <laughs> there for people that can't afford these expensive homes y'all got up? And, uh, They'd rather put a retention pond there than to build a home there for homeless people or whatever. But uh, I basically didn't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what the Bible gives me, tell me to tell you all. John uh, 14, let not your heart be troubled. Let me get my glasses. I know you all going to lay me out of here in a few minutes. But uh, a lot of stuff I need now. 
Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus Christ, this is Jesus Christ, right? Believe in God. Believe also in me. This is Jesus talking. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye shall be also. And, and, and whether I go, you know the way. Thomas said unto to him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. And how can, how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, this is Jesus talking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. You know why I come over here and I would like, like to read this scripture. For many years, 20, about 20 years ago, maybe longer than that, they uh, barred me from reading the Bible in city council. They barred me from praying in city council. But you know what? I talked to God about it. You know what God said? Frank, you're asking the wrong people. Talk to me. I'd rather talk to God than talk to y'all because you all don't seem to want to get nothing done for people of color. But I'm going to have to come down here, come down here with my... Uh, my, my stand, stand up kept stand to keep me up, but nobody seemed to care. Now, now in my church over there on the 1112 East Scott Street, they're trying to close it down. And, and, but you know what? Once they close it down, I had to go back to the streets and preach again. But I want to tell you all something. I wish God would bless all of you all. And keep our heads above the water. Thank God for him, my prayer. Let me get out of here. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in chambers? Real quickly. Mr. Uh, Massey. Mr. 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 Good's question. Ursula Richardson, who's in charge of our litigation department, this matter is an active litigation. I think she wanted to let you all know that this is standard operating procedure and that some of this material is and just so that you are aware this is a federal lawsuit that's in front of judge charlene honeywell in federal court we are in the discovery process and as a part of the discovery process um you can't just get free records so if it's going to take any extraordinary amount of time to get the records that mr doss is asking for and i haven't looked at his new request he sent a public records request first when he should have been operating within the confines of the actual lawsuit itself, the discovery rules. He just, I believe yesterday, sent an actual discovery request, and I'll have the opportunity to look at that. But even if that new request that's been sent through the proper channels, um, basically there are a lot of records that he's asking for, he is um, required to bear the cost of any extraordinary request. If he's just asking for a police report that's five or ten pages, that's something we turn over without any issue. If you're asking for thousands of pages of records, you're not entitled to those for free. So if you are in discovery, you have to bear some cost of that discovery when you are bringing a lawsuit, and that's the same for the city. So if you have any questions, I can answer those. Well, we thank you for running down here giving us a little more explanation on it, uh, but I still think $10,000 is a lot of money for some records, though. But again, uh, hopefully we, you, we can get the gentleman what he needs and the city can get what they need and we, we can move on. But I just want to make sure that he did get heard because, I mean, to me, it, it, it raised the eyebrow with my colleague here. That's a, a lot of money for some public records. So, again, hopefully we can get it worked out. And well, let, let me just, for the record, since we are in federal litigation and Judge Honeywell is in charge of the case, if he has an issue, when we're in a lawsuit, you bring those issues to the judge for her to resolve and not city council. So that would be the proper channel to get his lawsuit-related issues resolved is the federal judge. And I would agree, but sometimes citizens don't know that they just want someone to, to hear them or get them some help or get them in the right direction. But I, I, I get it. Mr. Doss is experienced pro se litigant, so he's not unfamiliar with the system. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. For the record, would you just please state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Ursula Richardson, Chief of Litigation for the Legal Department. Thank you. Is there anyone else in chambers who wishes to speak during public comment? 
Madam Clerk, we have two people online. Thank you. Mr. Randolph. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the uh, West Tampa Community Development Corporation. Today I want to talk about an upcoming meeting on May the 8th. It's titled Health, Public Safety, and Social Economic Development. The State of Health of African Americans in West Tampa. It's a holistic and nationalistic approach to creating a healthier African American community in West Tampa. As you know, African Americans suffer more from diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, uh, obesity, etc. in terms of um, health. The, public, the Health Public Safety Initiative combines these initiatives to increase the health in West Tampa. When we talk about health and public safety, uh, we deal with violence. Little do people know that your diet can make you more aggressive, drinking sodas, sugar, and things of that nature can contribute to what their violence intensity. The other thing is what we call intergenerational trauma, which affects the DNA as well as the psyche. If you want to understand why African Americans suffer so much from these health diseases, this will be a good place to look. The other thing is uh, health and socioeconomic development. This is what we're going to be looking at. What effects does the environment have on health in West Tampa? And what effects does general health have on West Tampa? Because this affects the job. In that respect, we're going to partnership with hospitals and of clinics to design a strategy that reduces the, um, the uh, uh, poor numbers as it relates to health as part of our health, public safety, and social economic initiative. Uh, we want to create an opportunity for folks in West Tampa to be more healthier. That means you can go to work. It also means that you can live in a better environment. I can't talk about the environment more and what uh, Mr. Walter Smith talked about, how the environment affects health. He's an expert. He's going to be part of the team to talk about our health initiative. I want to thank everybody for giving me an opportunity to present what we're talking about. I think that health, public safety, and socioeconomic development, these dots should be connected. Again, that meeting is going to be on May the 8th. It's going to change the narrative as we look at public health in West Tampa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Miranda, there's one thing we need to clear up. I apologize. Uh, you are head of the Finance Committee. Agenda item number 51 has been asked to be continued until May 4th. Would you make that motion? I certainly will. Item uh, 51 to be continued to May 4th. We have a motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion does carry. Move to open the 930 public hearing. Second. We have a motion to open the 930 public hearings by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. We'll now take agenda item number three, file number PH23-80973. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Council. Dennis Rajero, Chief Financial Officer. I've uh, had the opportunity to brief many of you, most of you on this item. Thank you again for your time. This is a request by the Tampa Preparatory School to issue approximately $13 million in conduit debt for construction of a new science building and other renovations. As council knows, it's called a conduit debt issuance because the city is simply a pass-through or conduit for the action. As a result, there'll be no financial nor legal liability on the part of the city. Uh, the city is not responsible for the debt Tampa Prep is. Council will also recall we've done other similar projects in a public purpose perspective for other entities. We've provided a memo to you with additional detail. Some of the recent examples were the Moffitt Cat Cancer Center, excuse me, and the University of Tampa. Again, we've provided a memo to council with additional detail. I'm here along with the legal department and Mr. Plummer, the head of Tampa Prep, to answer any questions you may have. Councilman Mascalco. So when we 
So when we act as a conduit, we charge a minimal interest rate, is that correct? It's not, uh, we charge a fee for the work that the city of Tampa is doing, and then the external financial team also charges a fee. We don't particularly charge the interest. The interest is on the debt issuance. So what does the city, how much does the city earn from acting as this conduit? In this particular instance, we'll earn about $58,000 for our work on the item. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Councilman Goose. Thanks, Mr. You know, we get calls and emails about this situation. Yes, I, I would just say, in, in the future, maybe with the, uh, the, the memos that, that come out in, in regards to these, uh, a little bit more detail so the public will know exactly why we're doing it. You know, they'll understand what the city's benefit is or what benefit we get and what the benefit or purposes of the entity that's asking for us to do uh, this favor for them. I think that would have cut down a lot of the chatter of, well, why are we is city money, how we pay this back, a bond. So I just think in future, I think more detail, a little more detail up front in the public don't have to worry. I know what it was. We've been doing it, but others don't know. Right? No, I appreciate that, Councilman. I think that's an excellent suggestion. We'll also highlight a little more aggressively that it has no city liability, whether it's financial or legal. Thank you. Councilman Brad. Thank you. And, and again, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. But yes, sir. as you stated, it doesn't add anything to us. We're not going to be responsible for the uh, $13 million. And, and I'm not talking about this entity, the school, of course. I'm talking any entity that we do this for. It has to be that they're responsible for the debt, not us. And if something goes wrong, we're not responsible for being held liable. Correct, correct, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Councilman yes, Carlson. Yeah, you, you said it two or three different ways, but just want to remind everybody that it doesn't cost us anything and it's not, um, it, we're not liable. So can I ask you another question when, yes, sir. The, I don't remember what was in on the space uh, before Tampa Prep used to be on the south side um, and then they moved across the street. But what was, is this, is it, are they leasing parkland from us? What's the, or is this city land that they're on? My understanding, of course, Mr. Plummer can uh, add additional information. It is contained within their current footprint. No, I mean the, um, oh, the, the land that they're on, is it city land like UT that they lease it from us? Uh, no. no. Uh, I do not know, but uh, Mr. Morris or Mr. Yeah, Massey apparently does. I may, know may, may I? I'm sorry. Sure. Councilman Miranda and I were having a discussion about this just the other day. Councilman? And we were just asking you, driving by, asked me what was here before this was here. And see, if I remember, that was Phillips Field on one side there to the, uh, to the west side and Hawk Plymouth to the east side. And they were, uh, in fact, Phillips Field was the first, I think, NFL field game or something that was played there back in the 50s or early 60s. I forget what it was. Maybe I'm wrong, but no, that's no, what I remember growing up. I think you may be right, uh, Mr. Miranda, but before Tampa Prep bought the property, it, was, it had become privately owned property. It was actually a development of regional impact that a private developer had gotten approval for, and they abandoned it and sold the property to Tampa Bay. No, all, all I'm saying is, yeah. I, I thought you were talking about physical yeah. things were there before it was that. I wasn't going yeah, to no, it's, I not, said, it's, it's not city, it's not It's not city land. property, it's not yeah. Land. I remember, uh, Councilor Miranda, I remember when it when they were on, like adjacent to UT, I, I never expected that UT would grow out that way, and now UT's filled that entire piece of land. UT now is all the way to Suffer Hills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, what is the pleasure of council? Any, any further questions? Uh, excuse me. So move the Chair, resolution. Uh, Mr. Vasky has a senior assistant city attorney. As this is an IRS required TEFRA hearing, there's some details I want to read into the record. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing on the proposed issuance of the City of Tampa, Florida, Florida Revenue Bond Tampa Preparatory School Project Series 2023 in an amount not to exceed $13 million. City Council authorized the holding of this hearing at its regular meeting held on April 6, 2023. Notice of this hearing was published in the city's website commencing on April 10, 2023. The proceeds of the bond will be loaned by the city of Tampa, loaned by the city of Tampa to Tampa Preparatory School, a Florida nonprofit corporation here and after referred to as the borrower. The borrower currently owns and operates a private school known as Tampa Preparatory School serving students in grades six through 12. The proceeds of the bond will be used by the borrower to one, finance the costs of a new 30,000 square foot science administration building and the revenue re renovation of approximately 15,000 square feet 
of space on the first floor and second floor of an existing classroom building. And two, pay certain costs of issuance of the bond. The project will be located at the borrower's, exist borrower's existing campus at 727 West Cass Street, Tampa, Florida. It will be owned and operated by the borrower. The bond shall be payable solely from the revenues of the borrower pursuant to, the, to a finance agreement and other financing documents to be executed among the city, the borrower, borrower, and Truist Bank. The bond is to be privately placed with Truist Bank to evidence its loan for the benefit of the borrower. Neither the bond nor the interest thereon shall be an indebtedness of, a pledge of, the taxing power, or any other revenues of the city, Hillsborough County, the state of Florida, or any other political subdivision or agency thereof. The bond will be a special and limited obligation of the city pay so, payable solely from the loan payments made by the borrower. This public hearing is required by Section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 as amended. Anyone wishing to be heard on the issuance of the bond or the nature or location of the project as described in the public notice will now be given opportunity to speak. That is all. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to speak on agenda item number three? File number PH2380973. Madam Clerk, I do not see anyone online. Second. We have. This is your opportunity to speak. Good morning, Council. Um, my name is Kevin Plummer head of school at Tampa Preparatory School here with my colleague, Mr. Jaime Marquez, who is our interim director of finance and operations. Um, there's, a, there's many opinions about our school, and sadly, not many people have actually been there, uh, as many as I would like. But I wanted to just give you a couple of facts this morning about our school. Tampa Prep was founded in 1974. It has 3,801 alumni and currently serves 705 students with 130 employees. Student body represents 30 different zip codes of the Tampa Bay region with more than 510 students coming from Tampa. We also serve students from Brandon, Lutz, Riverview, Apollo Beach, Lithia, St. Petersburg, Temple Terrace, Odessa, Valrico, Wesley Chapa, Thonatassa, Land Lakes, Ruskin, Clearwater, Gibsonton, Tarpon Springs, Palm Harbor, and Safety Harbor. We're known for our students' kindness our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, our arts, and providing an excellent education. Athletically, we've won more than 60 state championships and one national championship. We will provide more than $2.4 million in need-based financial aid with an average award of more than $10,000. Almost 40% of our students are students of color, and Tampa Prep, having no religious affiliation, <laughs> is also home to Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, and Sikhs. Tampa Prep has served and will continue to serve the greater needs of Tampa and the Tampa Bay region. We partnered with the city on important matters for our city, including the supportive law enforcement efforts for the Republican National Convention, where we closed our school for a week to support the National Guard, the Tampa Police Department, and more than 3,000 officers from a variety of agencies across Florida. We've been an instrumental partner in the development of the Responsibility Matters Campaign for Gasparilla and supported the national events, including two Super Bowls, the College National Football Championship, the NCAA Women's Final Four, the NCAA Division II National Baseball Championships, and additional local needs for the Strass Performing Arts Center, Pig Jig, the Boys and Girls Club, Metropolitan Ministry, Meals on Wheels, the recent public forum on criminal justice, and in two weeks we'll host another public forum on freedom of speech. We are as committed to the 813 and the 720 as you may ever find. Additionally, this project is a $27 million statement to the future of education, a building with the aspiration to model the direction of science instruction for the next 20 to 30 years, where partnerships with the USF Morsani College of Medicine, the Center for the Advanced Medical Learning Simulation, Tampa General Hospital, Advent Health, Baycare Health Systems, and Moffitt are being developed and will thrive. This project is a job creator and will create more than 400 jobs for Tampa over the next 16 months. Um, the bell went off, so I will just close. Seconds. What? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. I'll just close with thank you for your consideration. And we hope for your support. Councilman Maniscalco. 
Council Member Miranda brought up Phillips Field, but you didn't bring up a guy that you knew, John Matuzak, that played there. Yeah, well. Later uh, was in the crazy. movie The Goonies. I might have a picture of him. You might wall. have a picture in your wallet. Yeah. No, it, it was, uh, I, I believe that was the first uh, preseason playoff professional game, uh, not playoff game, but a preseason game that was done in Tampa, and it was brought over, I think, by the, the brothers uh, and uh, that had the print shop and the, uh, what, I mean, the, the, the lapel pins and stuff like that. Uh, the wonderful guys and Levy, uh, Levy Brothers. Levy Brothers. Levy Brothers, and I think that the big guy, I forget his name, I, I used to call him just big guy because he was big. And, yeah. uh, but they, I think they're the ones that started that movement to bring the first uh, preseason game, football game, was there. And there was also the state championship that I saw Larry Smith, which is a running back at, uh, at Robinson, and Larry Smith, I think was his name, who's the quarterback. And the team from Miami that came was a starting quarterback named Larry Rents. And Larry Wentz went on to be the quarterback at the University of Florida. And uh, Tampa was beating him to the last 10 or 15 seconds when Larry Wentz kicked about a 35 field goal to beat him by two points. But I was there and I enjoyed that. And that's why I lost all my hair in the excitement. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Lockett, I see you standing there. You wanted to speak during public comment. Yes. Good morning, Robin Lockett. Uh, in regards to this, I just want to know uh, what's the process and uh, in regards to other entities but, uh, having a relationship with the city as a conduit, what's the process of that and can anyone uh, do it? Because I didn't know that the city partners like this and uh, assist. So what's the process and can anyone, can other entities uh, have the same privilege? Yes, uh, thank you, Council. Dennis Rehara, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, yes, the, the process is, includes, excuse me, what we're going through right now. Typically, it's for a public purpose in partnership with a nonprofit organization. And again, we've done them in the past. If I can offer a few examples that may, uh, you know, shed some context. The Volunteers of America of Florida, Baycare Health, the Academy of Holy Names, the Pepin Academy, Lowry Park Zoo. So a nonprofit will come to us trying to issue debt that's tax exempt. The attraction of a tax exempt debt issuance is if you're an investor, you don't pay federal taxes on that interest. So you get your return and you don't pay taxes on it. That's great. In exchange, you're typically willing to accept a little bit of a lower <coughs> interest rate, which lowers the borrowing costs for the entity that's doing the borrowing. Tampa Prep, in this case, will have a lower borrowing cost. Good for them. So it really is often a win-win. So it's a public purpose. City Council and the legal department, bond council, have to decide that it's a public purpose. And, of course, the revenue stream to pay back the debt has to be scrutinized. Thank you, Mr. Herrera. We have a motion. Please, if there's no one else wanting to speak during public comment, we have a motion to close by Councilman Good, seconded Second. by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Councilman. You moved the resolution? Yes, sir, I did. Second. Seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item number four, file number TACPA 22-25. Good morning, Council. Sam Thomas with your Planning Commission staff. This is TACPA 2225, located at 1236 Channelside Drive. The request is to amend the future land use from heavy industrial to regional mixed use 100. This amendment received first reading and approval at your March 23rd meeting. It is back before you today for second reading. I'm available for any questions. Any questions for staff? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to agenda item number four, TACPA 22-25? Second. Are, are, are you wanting to speak, ma'am? I'm the applicant. I can, I'll do it quick. <laughs> I'm just going to restate what Sam said. Um, we received unanimous approval on March 23rd. Um, Alex Shaler formed a North Ashley Drive for the record, um, and we um, request your approval today, too. Available for any questions. Thanks. Thank you. I believe we have a motion to close from Councilman Goose, seconded from Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any objection? 
We have uh, motion passes. Councilman Carlson. I'd like to move item number four, um, file number TACPA 22-25 ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption and ordinance amending the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Element Future Land Use Map for the property located at 1236 Channel Side Drive from heavy industrial HI to residential mixed use 100 RMU 100 providing for appeal of all ordinances and conflict providing for severability providing effective date. Second. Sure. We motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Place your votes and record. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, in the next public hearings, these are quasi-judicial. I'm asking if anybody is going to make any type of comments or give any type of evidence, would you please rise to be sworn in? Thank you very much. Agenda item number five, file number AB2-23-03. Good morning, Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. And Council, this next item is before you today for second reading and adoption. This is a request for alcoholic beverage sales. It's for the property located at 5017 East Washington. Um, this is for a request for a large venue, and this is consumption on premise only. It's for beer, wine, and liquor. Site plan modifications were required to be made between first and second reading. Those changes have been made. The site plans have been certified and delivered to the clerk. And staff is available if you have any questions. Do we have any questions for staff? Thank you, petitioner. Thank you. Good morning, Jamie Mayer for the applicant, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700, and I have been sworn. Um, we have nothing to add, but we're certainly here for any questions and respectfully request um, final approval. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to make public comment on agenda item number five, file number AB2-23-03? Madam Clerk, do we have anyone online? Motion we'll closed. Second. We have a motion closed by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Councilman Vieira. Yes, sir. I move an ordinance being presented for second reading adoption. Ordinance approving special use permit S2 for alcoholic beverage sales, large venue, consumption on premises only, and making lawful the sale of beverages regardless of alcoholic content, beer, wine, and liquor on that certain lot, plot, tract of land located at 5017 East Washington Street, Tampa, Florida, as more particularly described in Section 3, providing that all ordinances, parts of ordinances, and conflict are repealed. Repealing Ordinance Number 2021-24, providing effective date. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Place your votes and record. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item number six, file number AB2-23-04. Thank you again, Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. And Council, this item is also before you today for second reading and adoption. This is a request for alcoholic beverage sales. The request is for a small venue classification, consumption on premise only. I'm requesting beer and wine. This is for the property located at 3407 and 3409 South Del Mabry Highway. Site plan modifications were also required for this application. Those, plan, those changes were made. The site plan was certified and has been delivered to the clerk. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions for uh, staff? Thank you, Thank counsel. You. Petitioner. Hello, Elizabeth Keller on behalf of uh, the applicant, 1000 West Cash Street. Um, we have nothing to add. We just thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Seeing none, is there any one in chambers who wishes to make public comment to agenda item number six, file number AB2-23-04? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Move close. Second. We have a motion closed by Councilman Good, seconded. By Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much. I have an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption ordinance approving a special use permit S2 for alcoholic beverage sales, small venue consumption on premises only, and making lawful the sale of beer and wine at or from that certain lot, plot, or tract of land located at 3407 and 3409 South Del Mabry Highway, Tampa, Florida, as more particularly described in Section 2, providing that all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict are repealed providing an effective date. Second. 
We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Place your votes and record. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item number seven. Pardon me, I'm sorry. We, have, we don't start till 10.30, we have two minutes. Two minutes. Let's take a three minute break.
We have a motion to open public hearing. Set 30 public hearing by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Brand. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Agenda item number seven, file number REZ 22 132. Good morning again, Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. And Council, this item is before you today for second reading and adoption. This project is the Rome Yard project. This um, location is in the general vicinity of 2609 North Rome Avenue and 2301 North Oregon Avenue. The request is to rezone the property from NMU 35 to PD plan development. It is for um, the allowable uses of all NMU 35 uses, retail sales, shopper's goods, business school, and vocational school. Site plan modifications were required to be made between first and second reading. Those changes were made. Um, the site plan has been certified and delivered to the clerk. And I'm available, Council, if you have any questions. Any questions for staff? The non petitioner. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Nicole Neugebauer, 401 East Jackson Street at Stearns Weaver. Um, I am here, and the developer is also here. If you have any questions, um, we're available and, and happy to answer anything, and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Thank you. Any public for any comments from public from public comments? Excuse me, easy for me to say. Anyone wishing to speak? Hello. We have a motion closed by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Councilwoman Hurtak. File number REZ 22-132, ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2609 North Rome Avenue and 2301 North Oregon Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification NMU 35, Neighborhood Mixed Use 35, to PD, Plan Development, all NMU 35 uses, retail sales, shoppers goods, business school, and vocational school, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Goods. Place your votes and record. Mr. Chair, Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just comment real fast. I said this the last time, just for the record, there were a lot of concerns in the public about the way the city handled the RFP on this original project. Uh, but I, I just want to state for anybody watching who had concerns about that, this is a separate issue. These are separate issues. And uh, uh, that decision was made a couple years ago and, it, and was by the city and it's separate from this. So I'm going to support this thing. Place your votes and record. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item number eight, file number PH23-80116. Good morning, Rebecca Johns, Legal Department. This is the second public hearing for the Master Infrastructure and Riverwalk Agreement for the Rome Yard Project. The first public hearing was held last Thursday, April 13th. Um, the developer is here if you have any questions, and we're here if you have any questions. Any questions for staff? Petitioner? Good morning, City Council. Nicole Neugebauer, 401 East Jackson Street. I am still here with the developer if you have any questions. Any questions for the petitioner? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to make public comment to agenda item number eight, file number PH23 80116? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, no one online. Close. We have a motion closed by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. 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 Any objections? Motion carries. Councilman Goose, you want to move the resolution? Move the resolution, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion uh, to move the resolution by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to do this on the next three also. I just want to say it again for the record, and in case somebody making flyers in the future comes back and looks at this, that this has nothing to do with the original RFP of the city, and whatever happened with that RFP is separate from uh, these decisions. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Agenda item number nine, file number BZP23-81029.
Good morning, Rebecca Jones, Legal Department. This is a resolution approving the Rome Yard Mixed Use Development Architectural and Design Guidelines. Those guidelines were presented to you as part of the rezoning that was just approved. Those guidelines are required to be approved pursuant to the land disposition agreement between the parties. Um, I'm here if you have any questions. Any questions for staff? Petitioner? Hi, Nicole Neugebauer, 401 East Jackson Street. Still available if you have any questions. Thanks. Any questions for the petitioner? Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to make public comment to agenda item number nine, file number BZP 23-81029? Do we have anyone online? Move to close. Sorry. We have a motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. What's the pleasure of council? Move the resolution. Okay. We have a motion to move the resolution by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. aye. Is there any, any further discussion? Sorry, I just want to, again, and I do this one more time, um, for the record, for any folks in the community that were concerned about the way the, C, the city handled the original RFP on this process, that was made a couple years ago, and it is, di is different and separate from this. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item number 10, file number BZP 23-81028. Rebecca Johns, Legal Department. This is a resolution approving the Rome Yard Mixed Use Development Phasing and Timing Plan. The Phasing and Timing Plan was an exhibit or is an exhibit to the Master Infrastructure and Riverwalk Agreement that was just approved. This approval is required by the Land Disposition Agreement between the parties. Here if you have any questions. Any questions for staff? Petitioner. Last time. Good morning. Uh, Nicole Neugebauer, 401 East Jackson Street for the record. I'm here. If you have any questions, thanks. Any questions for petitioner? Don't say last time. I'm sure you're going to be here in the future. <laughs> Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to make public comment to f agenda item number 10, file number BZ 23-81028? Madam Clerk. No one online? Move to close. Second. Second. Move to close by Councilman Maniscalco. Seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Move the resolution. Wait. Second. Yeah, we have a motion. Go ahead. We have a motion to uh, <coughs> move the resolution by Councilman Maniscalco. Seconded by Councilman Miranda. Any further comments? Yes, sir. Um, Councilman just again for the record, uh, for any members of the public who are concerned about the way the city handled the original RFP on this, that was a couple years ago that decision was made. This is about moving forward with the project, and so I support it. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we are going into, again, quasi-judicial, and I have seen some people come in that weren't sworn in before. If you have not been sworn in and you're given to give any type of testimony or any type of evidence, please stand to be sworn in. Okay. I, agenda item number 11, file number VAC 23-04. For Los Angeles Development Coordination, presenting file number VAC 23-04. I'd like to ask the clerk to share my screen, please. Any questions for staff? I do not see any questions for staff. Again, Ross Hammonds Development Coordination presenting file number BAC 23-04. This is a vacating request. The applicant's name is <clears throat> Alexis Gonzalez Sr. Property address 2102 West Hillsboro Avenue. Proposed vacant request is to vacate the portion of unimproved Albany Avenue, lying north of unimproved Frierson Avenue, south of Hillsborough Avenue, east of Howard Avenue, and west of Minden Hall Drive. This application was filed December 14, 2022. The applicant owns property to the west side of the right of way that is requested to be vacated. The applicant's reason for the application is to provide ingress egress for a planned development of a strip plaza and warehouse. The street was created by subdivision plat. Existing alley is approximately 13,250 square feet. Here's an aerial view showing the proposed vacating request. The 
Albany portion of Albany request to be vacated is in yellow. Applicant's property in red. Again, showing the plat, subdivision plat dedicated to Albany Avenue, the portion that requests to be vacated in red. There's an internal atlas sheet showing previous vacatings in the area. Again, the portion of Albany Avenue in red that is requested to be vacated. This is looking south from Wills Hillsboro Avenue near the owner's uh, property and the requested Albany Avenue to be vacated. This is looking northwest from North Alexander Road. Again, the general area of North Albany, the plat in North Albany is requested to be vacated. Staff have no objections to this vacating request. Easement reservations are required by TECO, special conditions for natural resources. Must comply with chapter 27 in regard to tree preservation and site design for any improvements placed adjacent to trees in vacated area. That concludes my presentation. I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Now, any questions for staff? Petitioner. Ron Wigginton, Legal Department. I believe the petitioner needs to be sworn in. Thank you. If there is anyone else in chambers that is going to be giving any type of testimony, the rest of the quasi-judicial, would you please rise to be sworn in? Yeah, basically I'm the applicant. Forgive me one second. Je sir, are you going to be sworn in? Uh, are you giving any type of evidence? Do you have a case before us today? Uh, Do you have? Yes, I have a, a case. Uh, then would you please rise and, and raise your right hand so that we can swear you in if you're going to give. Stand up. Stand up. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir, please proceed. Yeah, good morning, Council. I'm the applicant and owner of the property. Uh, basically, the petition, I had to do the petition because the mere reason I have two lots in the rear of the property, this right of way was platted only half of a roadway. The other half was never dedicated by the, the adjoining uh, property owners, so there's no way for me to develop a road and access to my rear lots. Uh, that was the reason for the vacating. Um, Will make the project more, more enticing. Um, the the other problem too is, is the access. Like I said, water and sewer. Uh, my other problem is that uh, I can't design anything until I know where this is heading with the uh, vacating. And that's the only thing I have. If anybody has questions, I'm, I'm pleased to answer. Any questions? Any questions from council? No. Sir, for, from the aerial. It looks as if this alleyway is clogged with trees. Is, yes, it, it, is, is it impassable? Yeah, right now, it's, uh, me and my server had problems with it. He had to put some offset stakes because uh, it's all full of uh, Brazilian peppers. Uh, no, no, you know, any, no grand oak trees that are there. There are some Australian pines midway in the property. Uh, but it, yeah, it is infested with Australian peppers. Any other questions from, uh, from council? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak in chambers that wishes to speak to agenda item number 11, file number VAC 23-04? Not opposed. Second. We have a motion to close by Councilman <laughs> Good, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. File number 11, file number VAC 23 slash 04. Ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance in the city of Tampa, Florida, vacating, closing, discontinuing, and abandon that portion of the unimproved Albany Avenue right of way located north of unimproved Frierson, south of Hillsborough Avenue, east of Howard Avenue, west of Mendenhall Drive, within the platted of Zambito subdivision in the city of Tampa, Florida, County, Hillsborough County, Florida, 
as more fully described in section two thereof, subject to certain covenants, conditions, and restrictions, as more particularly described set forth wherein, providing for enforcement and penalties of violation, providing for definition, interpretation, and repealing conflict, providing for shareability, providing an effective date. We have a motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman uh, Goods. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on May 18, 2023 at 9, I'm sorry, yeah, 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Agenda item number 12, file number VAC 23-07. Uh, Sam is available coordination, presenting file number VAC 23-07. This is the first reading consideration for a proposed vacant request. The applicant's name is Rodolfo Schaefer. Property address, 8301 North Edison Avenue. This proposed vacant here request is to vacate the portion of unapproved Juno Street lying north of Sitka Street, south of Waters Avenue, east of Edison Avenue, and west of North Boulevard. This application was filed on December 29, 2022. The applicant owns the property on the north side of the right of way that is requested to be vacated. The applicant's reason for the application is alleviation of public costs of maintaining. The street was cre created by subdivision plat. This existing right-of-way is approximately 12,350 square feet. An aerial view of the proposed vacant request in yellow, owner's property in red. Again, showing the proposed vacant request in red within the subdivision plat. Again, the proposed vacant request in red. This is within the atlas sheet uh, with the city of Tampa internal atlas. Again, showing a previous vacatings in the area that are hatched for these alleys. <coughs> this is looking east on, from West Juno Street. Again, approximate location of the alley or the street request to be vacated. This is looking west from North Boulevard. Again, an approximate location of the street to be vacated or proposed to be vacated, I'm sorry. Staff have no objections to vacant and request. Easement reservations are required by Spectrum and TECO. Special conditions include natural resources and fire. For natural resources comply with chapter 27 in regard to tree preservation and site design, improvements placed adjacent to the trees in any vacated area. Any use of vacated right away is conditioned upon meeting all National Fire Protection Association. That concludes my presentation. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions for staff? Thank you. Petitioner. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. My name is Rodolfo Schaefer. I live in 8301 North Edison Avenue. And I come over here just to request a basic vacancy of uh, uh, the June Street. Any questions for the petitioner? Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to make public comment on agenda item number 12, file number VAC 23-07? Madam Clerk, do we have anyone online? Move to close. Thank you. Second. Motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Councilman Carlson. Move um, file number VAC 23-07, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, vacating closing discontinuing or abandoning that portion of Juno Street right of way located north of Sitka Street, south of Waters Avenue, east of Edison Avenue, and west of North Boulevard within the Platte of Wilma subdivision in the city of Tampa, Hillsborough County, Florida, as more fully described in section two hereof, subject to certain covenants, conditions, and restrictions as more particularly set forth herein, providing for enforcement of penalties for violations, providing for definitions, 
interpretations and repealing conflicts, providing for severability, providing effective Second. damage. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goose? Yes. Vieira? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reader and adoption will be held on May 18, 2023 at 9 30 a.m. Thank you very much. Agenda item number 13, file number DE1 23 88 C has asked for a continuance until May 18th. May I have a motion? So we have. I'm sorry, Kamari pettis from the legal department. That's May 18th at, I believe, is 10.30 a.m.? Second. I'm sorry, so moved for Second. May 18th at 10.30 a.m. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion does pass. Agenda item number 14, file number E2023-8, Chapter 2. Morris Massey, Legal Department. I thought Ms. Elman would be here to present this, but this is a, an amendment to uh, to make all the uh, pronouns in the charter gender neutral, which was part of what was voted on uh, several years ago and what the Charter uh, Review Commission, which many of you served on with Ms. Elman and me, uh, recommended. So that's what this accomplishes. Any questions from Council? No, sir. Yes, I believe that uh, one, two, three, four, five people in this room all asked for that to be changed, and I'm surprised it's taken this long. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yes. Yeah. Councilman Vieira. I'm, excuse me, I'm sorry, Councilman Cross. <laughs> yeah, thank you to the legal department for uh, moving this forward finally. Yes. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? On agenda item number 14, file number E2023 8, Chapter 2. No one online. Moved to close. Second. We have a motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Councilman Vieira. And I, and I again, uh, as Councilman Carlson said, thank everybody uh, who was on the uh, the uh, Charter Commission, including the folks up here, folks there, uh, Michael Stevens, who I, I put on there and is a great guy. Um, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, amending the City of Tampa Charter in 1975 as revised in order to implement that charter change, including an ordinance number 2018-129 and approved by a majority of voters as Amendment 1 in the March 5th, 2019 election by revising the following sections to remove all references to gender, section 2.02 qualifications, limitation on terms, section 2.03 organization, section 2.10 veto, section 2.13 reporting and authentication, authentication. Uh, section 5.01A, Departments, Legal Department, Section 7.02, Budget, Section 8.07, Conflict, Section 10.02, Succession, Section 10.06, Reemployment, Repealing All Ordinances or Partial Ordinances, Conflict Therewith, Providing for Severability, Providing an Effective Second. Day. Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on May 18, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Just a, just a quick comment because the word gender is thrown around a lot. Um, just for anybody watching who hasn't followed this, um, the charter as it was written in 1975 would have only said he, and we've had three female mayors since then. And so when you say he in the charter and you have a female mayor, it's awkward. So um, uh, in many places, for example, they just changed it from he to mayor. Uh, uh, so it would be more accurate. So thank you, everybody. Councilman Vieira. Yes, sir. We're by 1579. We have a motion by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Matt All in favor say aye. 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 Councilman Goods. Ooh, Adams 337. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. 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 Councilwoman Hertek. Um, yes, I move items 38 through 50. Second. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Hertek, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. 
Councilman Miranda, you got finance? Yes, sir. I'm 52 to 55, sir. Second. Uh, we have a motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. And he, <laughs> thank you. Motion passes. Councilman Carlson, you have building and zoning. Yes, I'd like to move 56 through 64. Second. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> Councilman Maniscalco. Yes, sir. I'd like to move items 65 and 66. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Do we have Ms. Duncan available for staff reports? I know that she was going to come in in place of Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, actually, I spoke to Ms. Duncan about an issue she was going to bring before us, and she's decided to pause on that, so she may not be up here. Yeah. Morris Massimo Department, I, I saw a text or email from Ms. Duncan saying that she was not going to be here under an administrative update. The one item that I, I think that's not on the agenda that um, was a memo to you all asking that you add certain things to your workshop regarding the uh, proposed chapter changes to Chapter 27, um, I would put that maybe this would be an appropriate time to, to, to make a motion to move those items onto the workshop agenda for next week. If you and which items so are those, please? There was a memo dated March 31st from Stephen Benson, Dana Crosby Collier, and Eric Cotton regarding about nine different text amendments that they're, uh, they've had uh, public engagement on over, and they would like to add that to the workshop next week on April 27th to your agenda um, so that it can move forward to the Planning Commission in May and back to you all for June for formal consideration, I believe. Here, I have a copy of the memo. I've you want me to make this motion now? Surely. Why don't you go ahead make it now, please? I have this motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to add to the April 27, 2023 workshop agenda the planning staff's request to transmit the proposed amendment language for the January 2023 Land Development Code text amendment cycle to the Planning Commission. Second. Is that this, or was this for later? Thank you. All right. We have a motion made by uh, Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Uh Agenda item number 69, file number BZP 23-81006. Uh, Morris Massey Legal Department. This is the grant funding agreement that you all approved the CRA for the $14 million CRA grant uh, to, for rehabilitation and renovations of the Tampa Theater. Since this is a city-owned facility, the auditorium is, the city also needs to be a party to the agreement. So, that, so that's the purpose of the agreement today. This is identical to what you all previously approved as the CRA. I will let you know that we may be coming forward in May with a slight amendment to the scope. Uh, Tampa, the Tampa Theater uh, would like to add some projects to the scope um, at that then there, it's a relatively minor change that we'll bring forward in May, but this would go ahead and solidify the grant agreement for $14 million. Councilman Mascot. And the project that they wish to add or just acknowledge is the T2 project for the theater that's on the side, correct? The, screen, the, screen, the second screening room that they'd like to build on Franklin okay. Street, correct. Very good. Move the resolution. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. And now agenda item number 70, file number BZP 23-81038. Uh, they went together? Okay yes. then. Move the resolution Follow. item number 70. We have a motion by Councilman Maniscalco. Yes, that's, that's the first installment, approving the, the movement of the money for this first installment of the grant. So. We Seconded by to... Councilwoman Hurt, Hurtak. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposition? Motion Chair. carries. Chair. Councilman Goods. Mr. Madison. Yes. I know we approved it in the CRA. I just want to make sure we're clear. Uh, we, we always look to see that, that we get something for our money. And they did say they would recognize the CRA for giving dollars, yes, right? Yes, correct. There is an exhibit to the grant funding agreement that states that they will recognize the CRA for, uh, for providing the grant funds. 
and that we, you all will be recognized as a lead donor uh, in connection with any projects uh, in connection with the update and, and, and rehabilitation of the theater. So. Thank you, sir. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just for anybody who's watching for the first time, um, this is CRA money that comes from the Correct. downtown CRA. It can only be spent in downtown. And uh, CRA money first is to be spent on Slum and Blight. Since there is little or no Slum and Blight, uh, the CRA board, which is city council sitting at CRA board, uh, pushed this into um, amenities that are important to um, the culture and history of Tampa uh, that everybody can participate, enjoy, and uh, and that we're, we're proud as Tampa citizens that this is one of the icons of our city. Um, it cannot be, this money could not be spent on affordable housing or roads or anything else because it's in the downtown CRA. Also, I just wanted to add that uh, there have been a lot of great leaders in the last few years. Um, my colleagues may know more, but um, ones that I know that have been instrumental in saving and preserving it. Uh, John Bell, who was here a little while ago, uh, Linda Salsena, um, former city council uh, person and uh, former chair, Henry Gonzalez, a former chair who worked on saving and renovating this, and uh, way back a long time ago, Charlie Britton, who was a, a great, still is around, but a great visionary of the of Tampa Theater uh, many years ago. Thank you. Second. File number 71, uh, excuse me, agenda number 71, file number. Before you number. do the 71, I apologize, but Ms. Duncan did show up and had a brief update, and I apologize for the interruption, but she did have one. Ms. Duncan. My apologies, I had a nice quick pace this morning. Jean Duncan, Administrator for Infrastructure Mobility. I just had one item I wanted to bring to your attention along with uh, Dennis O'Hero. There was a couple motions made uh, regarding a CIP update. If you recall in January, we provided a CIP update and agreed to come in on a biannual basis to keep informing on key projects. And uh, so there's a motion currently for coming back on April 27th. There's another motion to come back June 22nd, both for a CIP update. So Dennis and I were talking about the mid-year budget review that is usually in the May timeframe. Uh, so we have a continuance that's gone in, but we just want to bring it to your attention that we'd like to take those two CIP updates and combine them with the budget mid-year budget review uh, uh, item on the May 25th workshop. So moved. <coughs> May I address this? Because it's, 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 it's very relevant. Um, under new business, I was going to bring to council um, the fact that the uh, Budget uh, Advisory Committee, the Citizens Budget um, and Finance Advisory Committee, as part of its process, would like to make its presentation to city council in June. And I'm wondering whether it's appropriate or better be better to put it off this into June to mm -hmm. have the discussion because you're going to have members of the committee there to make their presentation. I haven't. I, we spoke. I spoke with Mike Perry at the last meeting about this, um, and I don't know whether we coordinated. Ultimately, if you want to have this in May, um, that would be uh, council's pleasure. That would be fine. But just to let you know that I'm going to be at the request of the um, uh, the committee requesting that they have the opportunity to make a presentation relative to this sort of stuff in preparation for the uh, presentation of the budget and the CIP uh, to city council. So I just wanted to bring to that to your attention. I don't know if that changes your dynamics or not. Or it, no, Thank you. I appreciate you surfacing that. If I'm not mistaken, they're keen on uh, June 22nd. Which is, which is the June 22nd, 22nd workshop. workshop yeah. and, and we think and they think that'll be perfect timing. It's earlier than the past couple of years, again, to give council time to ruminate and review mm -hmm their recommendations as we gear up to providing the mayor's recommended budget shortly thereafter. From a, uh, from a May 25th workshop perspective, that is more keyed towards how we're doing in the current year. And again, Gene and I thought that uh, rather having a CIP update on the forefront and then a, C a CIP update right after that if there's, they're so interrelated. Typically, we'll give you a mid-year review, and we'll touch upon the capital improvement program, but we won't go into a lot of detail. This seems to be, uh, uh, again, two interrelated items that can provide council and the public a nice, broad, holistic view of what's going on right now with the city. But I think the timing is uh, very well placed for the June workshop, because then you'll have the Citizens Advisory Board come in with, uh, you know, looking ahead towards fiscal year 24. 
That's so that's that's uh, that's my thinking. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Chairman, I, I was going to in the April 14th uh, Citizens uh, Budget Advisory Committee. Uh, they passed a motion requesting that the city council invite the committee to present to council on June the 22nd. Uh, that's our workshop se session at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, what they want to discuss with us. That's why I was going to make a motion at the end of the meeting, but when we were talking about this, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was brought up. I was gonna, but I'll save this to the end, but I just want to make sure that they're already alerted that they want to come in on June the 22nd. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I think it's perfect that they have a month to, they can watch the presentation on, in May and then they have a month to think about it. The only thing I would ask uh, to try to prevent some of the issues we've had in the past, I would ask um, maybe um, CFO, chief of staff, others to sit down with the committee before they present to us, Copy. if possible, or meet with them. Uh, if they have recommendations, the best case scenario would be they present and then the administ and, and they're able to say, they or you are able to say, well, the administration has already agreed to certain things. That would, that would save a lot of time. Otherwise, there's a lot of there's potentially a lot of politics in it that the public doesn't want to see. And so, it would be great if there, if a lot of it was worked out in advance. And and even if you all were going to do something anyway, and they suggest it, you could you could say, you know, we worked with them, um, and maybe you modified or made it better or something. But just to to show the public we're all working together. Thank you. Understood. We'll pursue that. Thank you. I believe we still have a motion on the floor made by Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Carlson about the CIP on May 5th. 20, 25th, 25th, sir. 25th. Forgot to add the two. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item number 71, file number BZP 23 81027. Good morning, Council Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity. Uh, you saw Ms. Kayon Henderson that was in the audience. She went to um, a press conference at Tampa Hope and is on her way back, so you might see her hobbling in here in a few minutes. Item number 71 um, is a ship agreement. Uh, actually, this is an agreement between uh, the City of Tampa and the Pittman Design Group. Uh, providing a loan of $3,156,500. And this is um, ship funding uh, for this project. This project is 10 townhomes that will be built on the property. All of the um, homes are for people that are 80% AMI and below. And then 60% of those units um, have to be at 50% and below AMI. The Pittman Group uh, this allow, this particular project um, is a minority developer. Two of the three developers are here in the audience with us. We're really excited about this project. Uh, the $3.1 million also includes acquisition, um, assistance with acquisition of the land, and then the uh, about $200,000 per unit in subsidizing the units. Do you have any questions? Councilman Maniscalco. I pray that I can answer them. You can <laughs> Go ahead. Answer. You know you can answer them. So you, you answered the first question, and that was going to be, who is the Pittman Design Group? And uh, you said it was minority developer, correct? That's correct. And are they a local firm? They are, they are graduates of Tampa Bay Technical High School and came back home um, after working in various other metropolitan areas. Um, I have a list of, or have a list in my email of different projects that they've done. No, if you no, want to no, hear from them, they're no, here. No, it's okay. And then... What part of town is it going to be built in? Do you know? Yeah, this is on Columbus, Columbus and 22nd Street. Columbus, okay. Is it corner. some a vacant parcel then? Yes. Yeah. Northwest um, corner? I'm sorry? Northwest corner? Mm -hmm. Northwest corner. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Good, mm -hmm. because that, historically, it, was, it wasn't always vacant. I saw, I've seen photos of that area from back in the day, so it'll help fill it in yes. while addressing at least some of our uh, housing concerns. I know it's only 10 units, but it's 10 here, 10 there, and yep. it's very beneficial. So and using smaller lots to build infill development like this is pretty cool to have um, 10 townhomes yes. on that corridor. This is great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councilman Goose. Uh, I'm sorry, Council, 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 Councilwoman Hertak. Thank you. Um, I want to say uh, that I really love the design of these. Uh, it really 
fits the character of Ebor. So I, I want to say thank you to the design group for not only like just putting something there, but making sure it fits in. Um, I love the way that there's a couple two stories and then there's a three story. It's just a nice balance. It really, it, I think it will meld in really well. Um, I'm thrilled to hear that it's 80 uh, and below and 60 and below. 50. 50 and below. That's that's even better. This is this is really wonderful use of small, smaller but larger parcels. Um, we're going to be able to house 10 families instead of three. So I think that's absolutely fabulous, and I just want to say thank you, and I'm very excited about this. And I am I'm really think that we all should be watching this carefully so that we can replicate it elsewhere throughout the city. Anyone else? Councilman Goods. Well, I'm glad that you're, you're a Tim Bay Tech alumni of mine, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but the, what I, I wouldn't say the concern, I would say the growth and the train moving. Because when you look at the northwest corner, and you look at the north, the southwest corner, the southeast corner, we got problems there. So I want to make sure that the, that the CRA is kind of involved in this project, per se, of that area and kind of map it out because this is the time that we may need to go in there and start aggressively getting the CRA to be able to clean up some of that around and, and put by funds if you're going to put 10 brand new townhouse units. Because see what I don't want to happen, you know, you, you know what I'm going to do. I got it. I got it. You, you know where I'm going. Yeah, you don't want the just you don't want to invest three point one million dollars in this corner and the rest of the corner um, continues to see disinvestment and it's not a strategic um, exactly. influx of public investment. So I hear you 100% and that's what we do as CRA. I'm just going to ask for the latitude to be able to do that in my CRA hat, wearing my CRA hat um, in strategically purchasing property. You'll see us starting to ramp up um, in strategically making strategic acquisitions to protect the investments that we're making. This is a significant investment in that corridor and um, uh, we're on it with the CRA. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. As Mr. Goods was explaining, it's a, it's a corner that was at one time very vibrant. And uh, there used to be a little drugstore in the corner, a little shop, and then there was a garage across the street. We we're talking about now the, the west side, the two empties on both the north and the south, if I recall. And the problem is, as you said, it, Mr. Goods, it's not going to be compatible when you built these nice houses to look to the other side of the street and see something that's not so nice. And I'm, I'm being very gentle when I said not so nice. So it's uh, you're coming up by yourself to wear your hat, like you said, and, and do I know miracles that you can do. And we're not counting on miracles, but I know you'll get it done. Thank you very much for doing what you're going to do. Thank you. Move the resolution. Second. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, um, you talked about acquiring the land. Um, is it is it just going to the developers or going to a uh, um, uh, land trust? Do we, we don't have the land trust set up yet, right? This land trust is not set up yet. The community land trust, we pro we're expect that it will be established by the fall of this year. Uh, the legal department is working on all the legal piece to it to stand it up, so yes. And at the point that they were making, that sounds like a perfect opportunity for land trust. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. To, to buy the Council of Goods. Uh, you said the developers are here? Yes, sir. Yeah. You want them to come up? Yeah, I'm going to come up. Just a little bit. This is a major project for my minority group to come inside here. And you got yeah. your housing manager with her boot on. Um, boot on. Crippling it. <laughs> boot. Boot on. <laughs> um, well, so thank you. This is all three of them are the team. So. All right. Yeah. Good morning. Hi, I'm Dontavious Pittman. Give yeah, us a little bit of your history about yourself, your business, so people can know. This is what we've been praying for for a long time with this council. So we give us a little bit of something. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, Dontavious Pittman, born and raised in Tampa. Uh, as she said, as she stated, I'm a graduate of Tampa Bay Tech. Um, I graduated from Florida A&M, FAMU, with a master's in with a bachelor in architecture. I'll hold that against you. 
<laughs> and then I got a graduate degree in architecture from Florida International. Um, my experience has been in commercial architecture, um, Department of Defense, all the way to, to TD Bank. We've worked, at, uh, we worked with a lot of uh, different entities. And uh, what happened was my passion actually brought me back to Tampa once I saw the growth. Uh, when I left, <coughs> it was a little slower, but when I came back, I noticed that there was a lot of change going on and we wanted to be a part of it. So um, recently, we've been actually doing some development in the area. Uh, we have a couple of uh, multifamily projects going on. They kind of look similar to this project here. And our passion has been to provide affordable housing for that area since we, um, we grew up uh, uh, in, in East Tampa and, and south of East Tampa. Um, we, we want to keep some of the people in the community there. So that's kind of what's driving us at this point. Yeah, my name is um, Estate. It was a punch me near the third, and um, we ran. You know, we went to Tampa Bay Tech um, together, graduated, and um, attended. You know, family you also, and uh, you know, studied. You know, architecture, engineering, and um, construction management. And um, <clears throat> early as the age of um, 25, I was able to acquire you know multiple um, properties in uh, Sacramento, uh, Broward County, and um, just noticing what was going on. You know, working with them with you know, the developments going on in East Tampa and stuff like that. Um, we just decided to shift and, you know, come together and put all the hands together and do something a little more um, massive than, you know, what we're able to do individually. So um, that's basically, basically it. Well, we appreciate this. We've been looking for trying to give everybody a chance to eat because I'm always hungry, making sure right. that everyone has an opportunity, not the big, big guys because, you know, sometimes they don't let the little guys eat. So I'm glad that what our infield, we preached about that. That's starting to grow, and I'm glad that we're starting to kind of get the picture now to let everybody get an opportunity because everybody can't, I mean, it can do 100 units, but they can do 10. They can do 20. So this is a good start. I hope that with the new council come that it continues. We don't regress, but we keep moving forward. And I'm glad we have, I say, two brothers that, 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 that who live there, who understand it. And I always say, you know, when you, when you, you live somewhere and you have the experience, you understand better. Yeah. And your passion is not about the money, but that's one option, but it's about the people. So yeah, yeah. congratulations to you, and I'm happy to support this money. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, no offense to you, but there's a lovely lady behind you. I want to find out what her role in all this was. <laughs> um, good morning. Kayon Henderson, Housing and Community Development Manager. Um, I we met there's actually a third person who's missing as part of the group and i think we met them they were looking to do affordable housing on their own through some development and just kind of explaining what we do at the city and really wanting to we you guys have said it and we've listened work with some minority developers who otherwise wouldn't be able to do business with the city um, so we had an open rfp that allowed uh, different individuals to apply where we were able to look and go through the project and proposals instead of having it to be more of an exclusive project or RFP. It was more inclusive where we were looking to work with individuals who were trying to um, do business with the city. Councilman Cross. Yeah, sorry to belabor the point, but this is a, an important thing that we've all been pushing. I know Council Member Goots has been a big leader on this in the last four years. Um, I just want to thank you guys for stepping up and um, it's exciting that you're doing the small infill, the design, uh, the sensitivity of the community. Um, it, we've been looking for minority and black, especially black owned businesses. And it's great that you're in, that you're from the community so you understand it. So thank you and if there are any tips or ideas you all have on how to help us to do this better or more, uh, partnering with other businesses like yours, let us know. And thank you to Kayon and uh, Nicole and the staff for um, taking the initiative on this too. Great, uh, sounds great. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Move the we have a motion by Councilman <coughs> Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any objection? The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number 72, file number CM21 7167. Zero. Uh, if I may. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm just finding the report here. Um, I, and I didn't request anybody to come here for this because we don't. We, the, the report speaks for itself. Um, 
It says here that the uh, Tampa Police Department has partnered with a crisis center who has agreed to apply for funding through the Social Art Action and Arts Fund to potentially provide emergency <coughs> monetary assistance for violent crime victims. So what, what I been trying to do and with the wonderful help of city council and the administration um, is to see to it that the city can fund some sort of a program that helps um, uh, fill the gap I guess if you will for victims of crime here in the city of Tampa so it looks like you know that's coming forward and I always like to you know just uh, keep my eye on things and I do that by uh, having it come back to council so I, I would like to make a motion if I may for uh, this uh, issue of, uh, of victims of crime uh, assistance fund to come back to us in um, June first week now let's do second week in July uh, that, that's July available 13th. there you go July 13th for City Council to look at um, working through the, the um, partnerships that were noted in this memo as well as assisting organizations such as not solely uh, this but such as Rise Up for Peace and other victims uh, rights organizations we have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Nothing else. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Agenda item number 73 has been continued to October 5th. Agenda item number 74, file number TM22 77567. If, if I may. Yes. Yeah, me again. So I saw the memo and I spoke to the Chief of Staff, John Bennett, so it seems to be going forward. We got these funds uh, in the budget and I want to make sure that they go forward as much as possible. So what I was looking at with the help in, uh, of, of City Council Administration was to have a six-figure fund of $100,000 uh, to provide paid internships of $15 an hour for people with intellectual disabilities within the city of Tampa. So if you look at the memo, they talked about organizations like McDonald's Training Center, uh, Pepin, uh, et cetera, and McDonald's Training Center. My, my brother is a client there at the uh, East uh, Hillsborough County facility on James Ranch to do wonderful work. And, um, but uh, what, what I wanna see of this is to have specific departments that have paid interns uh, within the city of Tampa to be funded at six figures. So this is great, and speaking of administration, looks like it's going forward. So again, uh, I, I would like to, if I may, uh, have this come forward, let's say uh, the first week in um, June, uh, for, for a status update on where we're at. We have a motion made by Councilman for uh, Vieira, second by Councilman Carlson. All in favor, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. You, you are welcome. Mr. Vera, excuse me. Yes, sir. Are they Council looking at, we, I heard you say they're probably going to put it in the budget. Is that going to be as far as the police budget or general fund budget? Do you know? Now, if I may, you're, you're asking about the victims of crime issue? Right. Or, okay, yeah. No, um, that was, my understanding was, that was received and secured in this year's budget that we passed in September of last year. Where it came from, I don't know. So yeah, as, as it applies to that Councilman Goods, I'm not sure what bucket it comes from, so to speak. So um, yeah, I'm not sure to be honest. Agenda item number 75, file number CM22-79132. Mr. Biday. Morning Chair, morning Council, Dick Biday, Director of Mobility Department. Uh, this is a follow-up to an original motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco, uh, regarding traffic and road closures relative to special events uh, in the downtown area, particularly South Downtown. Uh, a memo has been updated relative to the previous memo that was submitted uh, and outlines uh, some considerations and actions that will be implemented by uh, late spring, early summer, uh, just in time for the next special event season. Of course, we have special events uh, all year round. Uh, we have been coordinating with several stakeholders, including the arena, uh, SVP, uh, and others, TPD certainly. Uh, and we've identified reactions, two of which uh, are immediate by late spring, and one is ongoing. So the two that we are going to uh, address uh, after listening to council, the concerns 
uh, having coordinated with the community as well in, in, in recent uh, months. One is to look at ride share and find more and convenient locations for ride share pick up and drop off on the east side of downtown. Currently, most of it happens on the west side uh, uh, off of Flat Bridge on Ashley uh, Drive. Uh, the other uh, action is to take a look at our traffic control plan, and that includes cones, barricades. Uh, we do plan to eliminate a lot of that with the exception of Morgan Street during arena events, uh, and then modify traffic signal timing plans, which are being developed as we speak, to reduce cycle lengths and be focused on ensuring that any inbound or outbound patterns, particularly inbound, do not impede traffic flow for employees and residents of downtown as they're headed out after the end of the day. Uh, so with that said, I'll be happy to take any questions. Councilman Cross. Yes, Vic, Vic thank you for all you do, and um, especially for hanging around to, to uh, discuss this a little bit. Uh, even though the presentation wasn't very long, I'm sure it was um, great news to a lot of people in and around downtown or people go through downtown. Um, I think the, the downtown plan, had, the traffic plan hadn't been updated in 10 or 20 years. And since then, downtown has changed dramatically, um, especially in, in and around the area uh, that SPP has developed. There's thousands more people moving through there constantly and multiple events. I think last weekend there were like five events at the same time. And so, um, uh, there's concern. Um, I mean, we, we, as we're leaving city council at night, when there's an event, we, we can't leave city hall because all the roads are shut down and the barriers are up. And so removing barriers, changing the timing, uh, it will all help that we can't, we, we have a mo more modern downtown. We can't shut it down, uh, because of one or two events. The, the only, the other thing that I would ask, and, and I said this, I think in an email is, um, please talk to the Harbor Island folks. Um, they, they, they're very frustrated that they can't get it on and off. And um, uh, last weekend, uh, because of the shortage, overall shortage of police officers, they couldn't, they tried to hire some additional police officers to help with, with some of the traffic flow as it affects Harbor Island and, and the, the, the police weren't able to help. And so um, Nicole and others in the city helped during that situation, but we've got to figure out um, a, a way to to help the traffic flow on and off of Harbor Island. They have only have two narrow ways that they can get on and off, and all of this around it affects it. And as it continues to grow, it's going to get worse. So any help there would be great. Um, Vic, I, I would like to uh, bring this back. Um, it, should I bring it back in August or October? What what would be the time when you'd be able to report on this stand deck report and everything? August would work really well because by then we'll be prepared. Uh, and real quick to address the Harbor Island concern, uh, we have reached out to SPP who is conducting further analysis, a study, and they've agreed to loop in and communicate with uh, the Harbor Island community. Uh, the, as the city, we have been engaged with Harbor Island, of course, earlier this year. Uh, we had a meeting with the community, shared some recommendations that were made specific to the Franklin Bridge uh, and the intersection of water in Franklin and further downstream. Uh, in essence, we're looking at signalizing those locations so that we can progress traffic coming onto and off of Harbor Island from Franklin Bridge, kind of similar to uh, the way we do on Florida or Tampa by synchronizing lights at key intersections and pedestrian crossings. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to bring this back on August 24th for an update. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson. Seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Vic. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. B. Day. Thank you. Agenda item number 76, file number CM23 79914. <coughs> Good morning, Council. Uh, Whit Raymer, Sustainability and Resilience Officer. Um, I was pleased to work on this item for you on behalf of several departments and also working with the county. Uh, we should have a presentation, if you guys could bring that up. It's Beautiful. there now. 
Um, and I'm joined by um, my colleague, Monica Petrella, Food Systems Coordinator from Hillsborough County. Oh, thank you. Um, who will um, present the majority of this presentation, and then I'll follow up with a couple of actions specific to the city. So uh, if you can go, let's see, to the next slide. Uh, here's the file number, and I appreciate um, you all continuing this for a couple of weeks as we, as we continue to collaborate with the county. Uh, so there's the original motion, here's the presentation, the rest of the outline, uh, and without further ado, Monica, take it away. Awesome. Hello, Council. My name is Monica Bertrell. I'm the Food System Coordinator for Hillsborough County. I work for Hillsborough County <laughs> Extension. Um, so today I was asked to talk about food deserts in the city of Tampa. I kind of want to quickly start with the fact that the term food deserts is actually not the correct term. Um, it's a pretty controversial term. Uh, the technical term is uh, low income, low access. So you can abbreviate that to LILA. Uh, so food deserts, just to, I know we're a quick presentation and I'm happy to talk to you all more in depth about anything you want to learn. Um, but for today, we'll go through the broad stroke. So food desert um, is controversial. It uh, sounds barren. It sounds empty. It's lifeless. And, um, you know, that is really no fault of those communities. Um, and so the term Leela, it's a technical one. It's measured. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not maybe as... Um, uh, buzzy, I guess, but it is the preferred term. So you'll see Leela throughout this presentation, and then as you get into more technical documents, you'll also see that. Um, I can't see my last. Oh, so yeah, that congressional port has um, a whole lot of more information if you are interested in learning more. So um, one of the uh, most useful tools when talking about Leela um, and food insecurity is the Food Access Research Atlas. Um, and so this was made out of the 2008 Farm Bill. It has um, a map that shows trends from 2015 and 2019, so you can kind of see how different trends for these Lila communities um, are changed over time. In theory, there will be uh, more data coming. Of course, it's up to Congress to keep funding these projects and keep collecting this data and maintaining these maps. Um, so the data is at the census track level. It can be downloaded for county or state level, um, but ultimately most of the data is at that census level. So um, as far as the actual content of Leela is concerned, uh, the way that they measure uh, access to a grocery store, um, they call uh, food stores, and it is a, a, a outlet that has over $2 million of annual sales. So automatically that is pretty much reducing any of your super small micro options. Um, and a lot of times that is because you can't really have a full service grocery store without really kind of getting to that $2 million in sales uh, uh, line. So that's just kind of a best practice in the industry is that um, under 2 million, you might have like a specialty product, but you might not have a full range grocery store. So, um, so the Leela map does not include anything under $2 million, um, and it uh, mostly focuses on super centers, supermarkets, and large grocery stores. So super centers, Walmart super center, supermarkets, or actually really you know, more like Costco, supermarkets would be your bigger kind of more um, uh, Walmarts, uh, and then grocery stores would be like what we see in Publix. Um, so low income, low access, so uh, in order to, be in, uh, to qualify, you have to be both. Um, so low income is a poverty rate of 20% or greater in the census tract. So th that entire population, um, if over, uh, I, well, I guess that's for the low access, um, but the low income, so that the uh, median income is 20% uh, over the poverty rate. That is what is deemed low income. Then the next part is low access, um, and that means that uh, at least 500 people, depending on if you're talking about urban or rural uh, census tracts, or 33% is more than one mile from a grocery store, or in rural areas, obviously 10 miles because of the difference in the communities and how you get, excuse me, get around. Um, the map will also have different ranges. They'll have uh, Leela at half a mile, so in your really, really, really urban areas, um, you know, that's like Chicago, New York City, um, it's, it's, uh, it makes more sense to have it at the half a mile versus maybe in or these mid-sized cities um, at that half mile. So in order to be deemed Leela, you have to have both qualifications. Um, so unfortunately, we have uh, in the city of Tampa a, a decent amount of census tracts that are deemed as Leela. Um, Digging into the data, you can kind of start to see some discrepancies. Like, for example, you might say, oh, well, I know on the corner there is a, uh, a place where you can go and buy produce. Once again, is it under that $2 million in sales? Does it have a full range grocery store? Or is it just a specialty product of just meat, just dairy, just produce? Um, and so 
Um, this map is a very brutally ugly map. It was a map that um, I created a long time ago just to kind of start the conversation. We're working on obviously making it a little more beautiful, but ultimately all of the um, d dark yellow uh, census tracts, those are technically Leela at a half mile. So this is not at a mile, um, although the Leela tracks are almost identical at both the half mile and the mile. Um, so yeah, when you see it, you kind of think like, wow, does all of City of Tampa uh, qualify as Leela? And um, the answer is sadly yes. Uh, many people don't know that in Hillsborough County, I'm not exactly sure of the city, but uh, one in five residents is food insecure. Um, so that's a lot of people. Um, and food insecurity uh, is more than just access. So this is kind of the real part. If, you, if in 10 years from now, if we want to say that we contributed positively to food security, it's not just a matter of putting grocery stores. It's also a ma matter of being affordable. Um, so if you have a Whole Foods in East Tampa, that might not be the most successful option. Um, it has to be reliable. So farmers markets, they are once a week, not in the rain, only in the summertime. That's not necessarily reliable. You can't necessarily count that if you are family planning, trying to plan your produce um, or your groceries. Um, and then culturally appropriate. Um, so this is something that Feeding Tampa Bay has talked about a lot recently. Um, a lot of times the food that they that, that residents are receiving through these like emergency options um, don't fit their cultural needs and then therefore they don't get consumed. And so once again, it's not just a matter of physical access, it is all of these things kind of combined together. The map that I showed you earlier, the Leela map does not reflect all of these things. The Leela map reflects just avail accessibility as far as is there physically a grocery store there that qualifies over these certain measures. Um, so applicable solutions, each of these things has a community effort that can uh, work towards accomplishing better availability, better affordability, more reliability, and then culturally appropriate too. So like I said, I'm happy to talk to all of you in more depth about each of these things, but that would be an entire workshop in itself. And so for today, we'll kind of just breeze through. Um, but I do want to say that, oh, okay, that this is something that we're working on. So I have the pleasure of being the food system coordinator for Hillsborough County. I work within Hillsborough County Extension, which is traditionally known for public service resource education. We're very well known in agricultural uh, communities, less well known in urban areas. But as um, the city changes, as the county changes, and as Extension kind of modernizes, um, our services are related more to um, education on expanding your SNAP dollars, how to make healthy meals, how to grow your own food. So my job is to string all these things together into a food system program, which um, is called Homegrown Hillsboro. Um, and so I'm actually gonna put this on the Elmo, I guess. I don't know if it takes away from the presentation, but um, I don't... It's on our Elmo, it's on our screens. Okay, so anyway, so this kind of gives you a general gist of what, um, what we're in the process of doing right now. So we are starting to do community engagement um, and asking people to sign up for a newsletter. The next step would then be to activate um, residents, community groups, uh, to make plans to accomplish those other Leela aspects. Um, and so the food system is more than just uh, physical access in urban communities or rural communities. It has uh, production, marketing, distribution, uh, waste disposal. So all of those things will kind of be housed together under this Homegrown Hillsborough Initiative. So as far as it relates um, today, uh, kind of like one of the best things that U.S. City Council can do is uh, decide to support Homegrown Hillsboro by allocating a staff member or really just um, kind of committing to being part of this countywide effort. Um, as we kind of get off the ground, hopefully launching next month, you'll start to see more, um, more media, more kind of structural organization, and the city plays a, a huge role in that. Um, there's also other options. Of course, access to land, I think, is kind of what prompted this whole discussion. Um, parcels in the urban areas for community gardens is one of a thousand solutions. Um, it is part of the mosaic of solutions, and so um, I'm excited to see what these parcels look like. I'm excited to see where they're located, but ultimately, um, parcels of land are for community gardens are will not be successful without the community aspect of it, and that's something that Homegrown Hillsboro is working on. Um, there's also other tools like financing. Um, earlier today, we learned about how the city was helping finance um, the uh, Tampa Prep. The city can also do similar things for larger million-dollar bonds um, to ultimately start funding some of these bigger infrastructure projects that we'll need. 
Um, so just to kind of recap, uh, Homegrown Hillsboro is the name of the food system program. We hope that the city will be um, an active partner. We hope that you will maybe give some guidance to, to uh, support this and to say that you would like to be part of it. Um, as of now, we have um, over 400 stakeholders that are signed up to participate in community interviews. These interviews will last throughout the year. We have four part-time interns that will be going out and setting these interviews with various churches, community groups, neighborhood organizations organizations, obviously traditional food system um, proponents. Um, and then next year we'll start to kind of do more of this action plan, um, community census prioritization, and then ultimately implementation. And that's kind of where this parcels will come in. So that is my presentation. I know it's a bunch of information. Um, you guys can have access to as much or as little as you need. Before we go into questions, uh, how can the public get this PowerPoint? Uh, I imagine that this is all kind of pub like is is it not published with the yeah, we can send it out the, this is not that's yeah. the question I'm asking how can the public find it from you um, I know that thank you yeah so I mean the whole presentation I think that wit probably has the whole thing my my, my portion I can send to whoever needs to get it to d disseminate it they can email me they can call me I can put it on a website okay thank you yeah absolutely councilwoman Hurtak. Um, it is on Sire for anyone who wants to uh, go to it. If you go to City Council Agendas, it's part of this particular item. You just click on it, and then the, this PowerPoint will um, come up, which is what I read before this. So I was so um, happy to see you coming today. Um, I had no idea this is what your day job was. <laughs> I know you from the farm, um, from Meacham Urban Farm, um, which is a wonderful example of a community uh, farm right in uh, urban the, the urban oasis that is uh, the city of Tampa. Um, this actually is incredibly awesome too because this goes back to my actual day job which is working on food security in, uh, in uh, countries internationally that absolutely have this type of work. So I've done everything from seed preservation to uh, how we store the crops, how we take them to market, and then, of course, um, what you were talking about with the homegrown Hillsboro, how, how folks can actually make and then sell products. So this is very exciting that we're also doing this here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would love, um, I, I do know that community gardens are wonderful, but take an inordinate amount of work and really need someone in that community to own it. Several people yeah. in that community yeah. own it. Yeah, you really have to have this desire to make that community garden work. So I'm happy to hear that we have someone, um, a way that, that we're planning on seeing what we can do about that, but also how do we get reliable food sources, like you said, like actual grocery stores and things like that. So um, I'm very excited about this, and I would love to work with you more on it. Great. I love that. That's my goods. I mean, beautiful presentation. Thank you. But in reality, how, how can we put that into play? How can we put it into play? I, I, I'm just I'm just okay. just looking at what you have here, and the councilwoman made mention to it. the community garden. I love the idea of the the, the community garden. I, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get a very very small percentage who's going to get involved with that concept. People are fast to go now. But to me, I believe charity starts at home. And government has a responsibility. If we know we have a food desert or low income areas, then what do we do about it? I'm a solutionary person. So why don't we have our own grocery store? Mm -hmm. Why don't we have our own county grocery store or city grocery store? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that have some prices that people can afford. I mean, to me, it's, it's simple. I mean, you know, you. But, but you got to want to do it. You got to have people, like-minded people, say, this is another avenue. Government can't do it all, but when you have certain issues, government has to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we are a capitalist society. I get it, but I think the amount of money that we throw away and spend on things, I think you, if we had our own county store or government store mm -hmm. that people could go get good fresh fruit from these gardens or what have you, now we're creating jobs. Yep. These are the things that I, 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 I would hope that people want to put on the table to talk about and implement. 
Yeah. And so the good news is that they do. Um, so I've been yeah. in this position since 2019 and my job has just been working with the community, um, kind of understanding where people are excited about this kind of stuff, um, what people's needs are. And so um, like, kind of stay tuned. I know it's not really like a razzle dazzle answer, but um, ideally by the beginning of next year, we will have hundreds of organizations, residents all engaged. The Homegrown Hillsboro program is actually much more extensive than what I was able to do here. As far as um, county owned grocery stores, city owned grocery stores, there have been several Florida municipalities that have had to open their own grocery store in order to provide for the residents. It can be done. There are financing tools that the city can help leverage in order to accomplish those things. Um, a lot of these communities are already organizing. I'm sure you're very familiar around these topics. Um, I am honored to say that I have like a specialty that uh, is uh, my expertise is this. So I'd be more than happy to kind of talk about how we can bring it into reality. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I know I ain't crazy. There is a way to get it done, but you gotta wanna get it done. I wanna get it and done. You gotta have people like that wanna actually help people. There's people that wanna get it done. Uh, you know, I I I I understand it, a young lady, I, and I respect what you're saying, but we ain't got it done. I know. So but here I am. You're here, you're one person. <laughs> but you you can't make the decision of putting money someplace or doing certain things to get it done. See I know what I'm saying? So it's a different kind of bureaucracy. I'm glad that you were able to tell us about this, but I, 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 again, for me, solutionary, and if it comes to a, a county grocery store, city-run grocery store where people can go to and flock to, like a Walmart, a superstore, then I'm all in favor of that. Mm -hmm. but thank you for the presentation. Absolutely, and I think that um, Mr. Reamer's presentation is also gonna talk about some of the applicable aspects. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you for your presentation. You know, it's very eye-opening when you show these, did you call them, Lila, 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 L I L A, yeah. And the parts of the city that are most affected. I saw one little quadrant in South Tampa, and I think that was right south of Gandy. It, I, I mean, this is just I yep. know, the map is a map. Cool. But, you know, parts of like where I live, I'm at Hillsboro and Havana. I can walk to Publix, I can walk to Dollar Tree, and if I can walk a little bit more, I can get to save a lot. Mm -hmm. And in between, there's fast food places. There's I have access to fresh food. If you go to Hillsboro uh, and you go east of the interstate, there's a Walmart, and then there's the San Juan, which is very popular. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's very limited. You go down Martin Luther King, and as you cross the interstate going east, it dries up. A friend of mine was here a couple weeks ago visiting from out of town, and we went over to the end of to the city limits going east. And I go, you see how everything changes once you go east. There's the Winn-Dixie at Nebraska and Martin Luther King. But beyond that, MLK dries up. Columbus going east dries up. Whereas the rest of the city, there's access to places. And I mean, the food is just, it's the basic necessity. People need access to not just food, because you can eat fast food, you can eat convenient food, convenience store food, but you need healthy, good food. And that's what we need to promote with that. Also. Um, you know, I made this motion regarding identifying the food deserts, which you, you, the terminology is different, as you've mentioned, but there are so many places in the city of Tampa where there is no access. I hope that Mr. Uh, Remmer, when he speaks, um, will you be identifying the plots of land that we own that could be activated as community gardens, for example? We mentioned Meacham. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, he's there all the time. Mm -hmm. I've seen other community gardens. Seminole Heights years ago was the first one that I visited back in 2010. And like you said, you need the community support. The community support is going to be there. People want access to healthy and affordable food because the costs are going to be significantly less when people grow it, you know, in, in that in that form instead of going to a grocer. Prices are different. You buy from Walmart, produce is priced whatever. You go to Whole Foods or Fresh Market, it's going to be even more expensive. It is what it is. However, it's a big city, and people don't shouldn't have to take two buses to get to another part of town to get access to, to, to just, just basic necessities. I mean, it's just wrong. I hope that, you know, again, with Mr. Remmer, when he, when he makes his presentation, that uh, he shows us where in the city we own vacant parcels that are not being utilized, mm -hmm. um, that we can ac access and activate to uh, build these community gardens because they're successful. I've seen how they work. Uh, but we need to do more of that. So mm -hmm. I'll wait for that presentation. Thank you. Great. Councilman Miranda. 
Thank you, Chairman. I, I noticed a lot of things, and one of the things that I saw on top of one of those circles that you have was recycling. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, I forget what day it was, but I was watching uh, some parts of a TV show on the environment, and there was an individual that uh, was far away from here. I don't know what even country he was in. But what they're doing is getting plastic and bringing it in from the ocean, from everywhere where they're gathering, and they're recycling the plastic into making what? Cement blocks. Okay. They get cement blocks and putting with so much plastic in it, the yes. cement block is lighter, just as strong, and, it's, and, and, and it inhibits the sun from coming in because there's a, a, a natural. So they're getting the same things that we're throwing away and, you know, we're killing ourselves. The ocean is full of so much plastic that soon enough there's be no fish, no nothing. And they were showing all that underwater. I didn't have time to stay watching the whole show, but I, it was an eye opener on what they're doing. And I don't even think it was in the United States of America, it's mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And they were doing something that was invigorating because I noticed the plant that we have here, Refuge to Energy, there's a lot of plastic that goes there that has to be disposed of. Mm -hmm. And that's another avenue that somebody who wants to go into business and maybe get that plastic, join up with somebody who's making cement blocks and do the same thing I saw on television. I'm not saying I'm going to do it because I'm not, mm -hmm. but somebody else can. And it, it's uh, it, things that you learn, like what you're doing yourself and giving a boot up to, to make sure that things get up and get started. And they're right, this has been going on before 2010. It started in South Seminole Heights and through there, when I remember the, the, the way back 20 or 30 years ago it started. But it was still in an embryo state then, but now it's growing a little bit more and will continue to grow more. And you know, it's not only the food, it's also exercise. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that we eat too much food and we don't exercise too much. And therefore you have a problem, a health problem. But the, I didn't even know what station I was watching and not I'd go look at it again. But it was something that was invigorating to my mind because we throw away all this plastic anywhere and we're not using it back. And that's why we have a problem with the environment, one of them. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank you for being a, a, an eye opener, a light in the sky and saying this is what you have to look forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Councilman Vieira. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually got a question, and poor, poor Mr. Massey doesn't know this is coming, but, you know, Councilman Goods brought up a, a, a good point on, um, you know, if, if, um, if there are certain areas in, in town where the private sector is not investing in, in groceries um, and, and government coming in and, and doing, you know, something that's obviously going to potentially be a revenue loss, but it's such a needed thing for the community. Um, it, it, this. Is that something the CRA can have any involvement in whatsoever? Not to put you on the spot, sir. <laughs> I know he's got like, oh, Lewis. It, it has to be consistent with both the statute and the plan. And there's nothing in any of the plans that would support us opening a grocery store. That doesn't say that we couldn't look yeah. at potentially amending the plans. We have CRA dollars has supported community gar gardens in several locations, including Meacham. Mm -hmm. There's one in West Tampa. Um, the city has made uh, parcels available to not-for-profits and religious institutions for community gardens. So we have done that sort of thing before through the CRA. The CRA could also, and I think it has been in East Tampa, been used to help a simple property and, and help provide economic incentives for a private grocery provider to come in. And I, I, that's been more the avenue, and I will tell you legally that's more, I'd be more comfortable with us trying to provide that kind of support. But I, I get it. So there is something there. Um, and, and whatnot, but, but if, if Councilman Goods were to make a motion uh, from the, the city looking at it, I'd be glad, and he's not here, but, but I'd be glad to, I didn't know he wasn't there, but, but I'd be glad to um, uh, support that, obviously, because I, I think that's a, that's a great endeavor, whether it's CRA or city, it's uh, something that's uh, very, very necessary. And Councilman Goods, I was actually asking Mr. Uh, Morris Massey about potentially um, the CRA looking at your idea of a, of a grocery store and seeing whether or not it's feasible. I was saying if you wanted to do a motion here in city council on that from the city's perspective, I know we'd love to support that. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Massey. Appreciate that. Mr. Uh, Chair, we talked about that several times it, when I was on the CRA board and the current CRAs. Uh, and we, it always gets shifted someplace else. And I don't know why. Uh, you know, because I know government doesn't be involved, but I, I think that you have to look at how can you actually partner with a nonprofit or somebody else to be able to do some of these things. But 
And, and again, I, I've worked on the community gardens, and they're, they're, and they're good things, don't get me wrong, but they're not gonna solve the issue that we have. I'm cool. gonna be candid with you, I'm a candid person. You know, you have publics, you have all these different places. I was told a long time ago when I coached ball, see, when you build it, they'll come. Like Publix bills, I get people in East Tampa, go way down the street to go to Publix and buy the Publix cakes, go take them to the schools. But Publix won't come to those communities because they say they don't have a high educational level, you know? They don't have a degree and all these type of things and a matrix or whatever. Then you throw these family dollars and with all the, the Roman noodles in our communities, instead of just saying, okay, how do we find a piece of property that maybe city owned, county owned, and then now you build it to where you can have prices reasonable for those people to come. You've got your community garden, they can go sell those fruits that they're making and come sell it just like you do at the market. Now we, we're generating employment, we're generating uh, communities, and you, you're giving communities healthy foods to get rid of diabetes, which I know all about, high blood pressure, these type of things. So I, I just look at if there is a way, Mr. Vieira, to where somebody will listen, and see if we can get some property and get some nonprofits to actually have a major grocery store, a municipal grocery store, a county grocery store. People will come if you build it. Just and get back to the, the CRA point. This, the CRA is typically used to provide physical improvements to a community, not to operate a store. Correct. So, yeah, what we what the CRA could be used for is to help assemble property. Mm -hmm and to work with a not-for-profit if they wanted to provide a low-cost grocery or, or uh, food alternative uh, location. I mean, we certainly could look at doing those sorts of things, but that really is the focus of the CRA. The CRA is not set up to folk, it is not set up to run grocery stores or social programs. That's just really not what the CRA is set up to do. And Mr. Mask, you said that, you know, there's a, there's a big grocery store chain out of Atlanta. I tried to contact them a couple times uh, to see would they come down to the southeast to the Florida area. Huge big chains uh, of stores. You just got to find the right chain that will come that may partner. Uh, but but again, you know, I'll, I'll make mention to Mr. McCray in reference to the CRE board and, and see if they can bring that up again. I'll be gone, but I, I won't be out of the picture, but to maybe bring that up to see how we can do that. And Mr. Morris Massey is right, uh, maybe assembling some partnerships somewhere and then, then you look some nonprofit that might can run an actual grocery store for us. And I do want to quickly respond and just kind of put it out there that um, nonprofit grocery stores uh, are not really a thing, um, but community owned co ops are. And ultimately, community owned co ops are a way to start generating wealth in the community as well as maintaining local control. Um, lots of municipalities have supported co ops, whether that is through technical support, providing land, um, you know, uh, having a place for people to hold meetings. There's a lot of ways that municipalities can support grocery co-ops. They take a while to kind of get started, but they are, uh, once they get started, their attrition rate is very, very low. Well, I, when you said about independent, you know, B&D Groceries was independent at 40th and Hillsborough. Winn-Dixie used to be there, but Winn-Dixie sold out and went down the street many, many years ago. And b and was a thriving grocery store at Fortith and Hillsboro. But then Mr. Davis, he got tired and sold it to some other folks, and they turned it into a different type of grocery store. That's when you talk about culture coming into play, and it didn't sell the type of food and items of that, particular, of that general area. No one understood it, and then it finally went, uh, caught on fire, let's say that. So uh, I, I do think they can work, but when you go and look at the cultural aspect, you've got to have the right foods like Publix, like Walmart, these places, and have them in those stores, and they will thrive. Because I used to walk across the street as a kid and go right to those stores and, and buy groceries, you know, as I was growing up. So uh, just, just I, I, they can, but you got to have the right culture aspect to make sure they're working. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, a few different things. Number one, um, this is the kind of topic that we need to put on a workshop <laughs> um, because we, that we could have a lot longer conversation about it. I want to let you know we have, um, is Nicole here? No. Um, we have a retreat coming up, planning retreat for um, the CRA coming up, and, and you may want to attend or watch and it, during public comment or whatever, get up and, and be a content expert. Um, that would, because this is something that we obviously should, um, should look at more. Um, 
I'm not a, I'm not in favor of um, the CRA or the city running grocery stores. Um, I've been in government-owned grocery stores in a lot of countries, and like Cuba, and they don't run very well. And that's you know people leave countries to to come here to get away from that. Um, I think that um, that that we um, we have a concept that, that the city council has been pushing for three or four years, which is the neighborhood commercial districts. And um, people have driven me around places in East Tampa, for example, where they should go, that they should go in lots of other places. We've done a little bit of beta test in South Tampa and, um, and um, West Tampa for doing some planning, but we need to do this on a larger scale. But what we need to do is, is work this in with planning and Stephen Benson should be involved, but we need to um, think about where the, um, the neighborhood commercial district should be, what should be the node, and kind of how we should plan that out. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> we should work with the CRA to, um, to either build an anchor building on a corner or we should um, uh, work partner with the private sector or nonprofit sector. But imagine a building that has a couple shop, shop fronts downstairs, maybe um, offices on the second floor and maybe even affordable housing upstairs. But um, that would be like an, an investment to start the investments on the corners in these places. Um, and then um, with just like with a lot of CRAs investing in real estate, then we could potentially offer subsidized rent to somebody um, just like we do with affordable housing and other things. I, I think we should start at least with something like duckweed, maybe less the alcohol part and more of the fresh food. Um, but you remember the old... Um, grocery stores a long time ago were smaller and then they all became big. Um, I personally was involved in the, in the um, South St. Pete um, project, Tangerine Plaza with um, Cash and Carrier that became Sweet Bay, then became Walmart, and that was just a disaster because it's a big thing that you have to subsidize on a large scale. Whereas if you have a small square foot property, um, some places like Boston Community Capital even will take equity in exchange for um, uh, or, or, or some percentage of profit in, in exchange for lower rent. Um, so anyway, the, the point is there are a lot of, um, a lot of ideas there that we can, that we can look at. Uh, but I appreciate you uh, bringing this to us. And oh, the last thing I wanna say is um, I'm really disappointed at Google just now. I'm really disappointed about the, um, the term food desert. Um, I can't, I, I need to do some more research, but I can't find online where it's so offensive that we can't use it anymore. I think I'm a branding person. I think it's a huge mistake to switch to Lila because nobody knows what it is. Uh, it looks like Food Desert's been around since the 90s. I think people are just starting to kind of, people who are in the middle of it understand it, but the public kind of understands it. We throw out a new term. The money we're gonna have to spend to educate people on, on a new term is gonna, is gonna hurt the effort. Um, it's okay to educate people that you can't use it all the time. If, it, if it's so offensive that nobody can use it, fine. But if we get rid of it completely, we're, it's going to be impossible to have the money and resources to educate the public on what it is because uh, so many years have been spent educating people on that concept. And I think it would set back the, um, the effort a lot um, because we don't have the money to, uh, to promote this in the way we need. Thank you. Uh, Council Whit Raymer, Sustainability Resilience Officer. I just wanted to respond to the, the second and third parts of the motion about the availability of parcels. Um, if we can have the presentation back up. <clears throat> Thanks. So uh, just, uh, I did want to note that um, while it might not be in the CRA planning documents to support these types of efforts, uh, there are at least uh, two city planning documents that, that Stephen Benson's department did contribute to. Uh, talking about kind of nurturing food access, uh, Action 2.2.6 of the Resilient Tampa Roadmap is one of them. And then for the first time, I'm showing uh, a couple of snippets from the forthcoming uh, Tampa Climate Action and Equity Plan. This will be released hopefully in a couple of weeks. And uh, there is an entire uh, chapter on food and food access uh, related to, to climate. So I just wanted to point those out to Council. Um, uh, Monica mentioned over 200 partners that um, Homegrown Hillsboro works with. I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to a couple of, of kind of bigger organizations that the city of Tampa has worked with historically and will continue to work with. But of course, there are, are many, many more, uh, especially community-based organizations um, uh, in addition to the, those that I'm showing here. And the final part of the motion uh, asked the city to research potential parcels. Um, and now we, I, the, the motion I think was for the, for the work with the Hillsborough uh, County Property Appraisers. We work with the city of Tampa Real Estate Department 
uh, on these remainder parcels. Uh, I do have an Excel spreadsheet. We just kind of took an, a snippet to show uh, you all. There's a list of about uh, 20 that we think are, are very good candidates. Uh, and then um, a list of about 40 that are potential candidates that will need additional research. Uh, this is kind of what a couple of those remainder parcels look like. And the city, I think, is looking at uh, lots of options for these remainder parcels. These are the parcels that we deemed would not be appropriate, for instance, for affordable housing development. Uh, their size was kind of maybe more um, uh, lent, lent more to a community gardening and there weren't um, trees that shaded the property. So we've kind of just done a preliminary cursory review of these properties. Uh, I will tell you that, um, you know, to reiterate what's been said here today, these parcels will not solve uh, food access by, by virtue of community gardening. Uh, Meacham, uh, as you all know, there are farmers there from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day. It is a full-time job. Uh, we work with the Coalition of Community Gardens and other uh, local community gardening groups. Uh, we're currently, we're facilitating a $300,000 grant with the Coalition of Community Gardens. We just submitted a million dollar grant to the Environmental Protection Agency under their Environmental Justice Program to help uh, with community gardening on 22nd Street. Councilman Goose at 22nd Street, uh, Healthy Street, uh, Healthy Steps Garden. And uh, those are good efforts, but again, I don't think they're uh, gonna solve uh, kind of the larger access problem. Uh, so uh, we do have the parcels available. We will continue to research those uh, at the direction of council. Uh, but, but you've got to have community support and engagement around this. Otherwise, you get a couple of excited people. They build a community garden. They move. They, 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 um, they become um, uh, unable to support the garden. And then it becomes ultimately an eyesore for the community. This happens at schools all the time. You get a couple of uh, parents that are really active and then they, they move up to middle school and then the community garden at the school kind of goes goes barren so uh, we, we, we really is a, a all hands approach here and um, that's the end of uh, our, our presentation Councilman Matt Scott. so the properties that you deemed as you know a, the possibility the upper uh, part of the list um, are in the parts of the city that need it the most. And I know it's not going to solve, you know, community gardens won't solve the issue. However, they have nothing or close to nothing or are considered, whether we use the term or not, it is food desert. If, if you and I went out there right now, the options are more limited as they would be in other parts of the city. So the community garden requires a lot of effort. Meacham is a, is a big... Um, I want to say organization. It's a, it's a big operation. A big operation, yep. exactly. And you have people, like you said, are dedicated there every day. They don't have anything, or they have very limited options in certain parts of the city. But we can create these uh, community gardens or partner with organizations that will do it and help create new opportunities for people that are in that community. They can be proud of what they're growing. They're helping aid the situation, may not solve the process or the problem, However, it's creating something that's not there and giving people access because it seems like you uh, showed a property on Shadow Lawn, you showed some of the, they're in the middle of neighborhoods. People can walk to these places. They don't need a car, they don't need to take a bus, they, don't need to, they can walk there and get what they need that's healthy, a healthier option from whatever, um, whatever else they, they, you know, they, they could be eating. So I think every little bit helps. Um, you know, we have to start somewhere, and I think, you know, if we're going to transform Tampa's tomorrow, that includes all parts of the city. And we see that we have a, a big problem, as shown on the Lila Lila map, you know, where these, these corridors are. And I think we need to, I mean, we have to start somewhere. Again, we're not solving everything, but we're just like the housing crisis. We're not going to be building 10,000 units tomorrow, but we're doing a little here, a little there. It all, you know, it all works in conjunction for our success as, as a whole, so. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, um, the, the one thing that's scarce in Tampa already and is going to be more and more scarce over the next 10 years is land. And um, it, if we have vacant land, it's a, it's a good idea to, to use it um, temporarily. But, um, you know, what urban areas are going to is vertical um, gardens like putting a garden on top of a parking garage or something like that and and maybe in your research you'll you can find ways to um uh you know singapore puts them in community centers um on the top um but um you you might have some ideas that you could give us as the cra board in 
in incentivizing. Like instead of giving a fifty thousand dollar facade grant, if so, somebody like the guys who are here earlier are building a ten unit uh, building, then we can say, well, we'll instead of a facade grant, we'll give you a fifty thousand dollar grant to put a community garden on the roof or something like that. Um, so anyway, just just if you have any ideas like that in the future, please come back to us and let us know. Thank you, Councilman Herta. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I, if I were to venture a guess, I would say for a parcel of land that's been undeveloped to actually make it a usable community garden would be somewhere in the range of like five to ten thousand dollars, maybe even more. Um, oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can speak on that. So ten thousand dollars is usually yeah. the starting, mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of maintenance. Um, a big issue is access to water, which I think these parcels yeah. do have. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, sheds, tools, uh, soil, um, yeah, you dirt. know, all of that. Mm -hmm. So 10,000 is like roughly the starting, um, and it has annual costs as well. And then of course, like, uh, the best model is to have a part-time paid person who is yeah. there. Um, and that's obviously expensive as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about the expense of that, but one of the things, uh, I have been, I watched Meacham grow from literally uh, like a lot that had a sign that said urban farm coming soon. And I was so excited about it that we like, I made my poor husband bike down there like every three months or so just to see where it was going. Uh, and then when I ended up talking to the folks who run it, uh, one of the things that they said would be most beneficial to them is more space to grow things that they can then uh, sell to people. Um, so just allowing other people to use that land. Uh, and the, the great thing about Meacham that most people don't know is that they're a part of um, the EBT program. So, uh, and basically every community or rather um, garden can do this uh, farm that they, they basically take your EBT and double it. So you're able to afford that nutritious, locally grown uh, fruits and vegetables. So I, I think that's even something that we could look at in terms of like partnering for some of this land that might not be. The problem is they need, you know, good size usable land. And so that's, that's the trick. It's, it's, it's hard to figure out where a good place to put some of this would be. But I think uh, from, from this discussion, it seems that one of the great things we could do sitting as a CRA board is to look at some land and maybe offer some serious incentives for um, one of the low cost grocery stores to come in. Uh, you know, what I think of, I think of Aldi because I'm, I'm, I regularly shop at Aldi, but I have to basically drive out of town to do it because that's where they put their stores because they're cheaper. So how do we take some of those low cost opportunity um, stores, maybe talk to them and figure out like how we could get them to be in those locations as not, not buying it and starting it ourselves because I lived in St. Pete when, when that was an issue with Tangerine Plaza, but what, what can we do? What can we learn from St. Pete? What can we learn from other areas that have done so and encourage, um, monetarily encourage those stores to come into the areas in w where we need them. Yeah, thanks, Councilman. I think it's a great idea. And, and um, Meacham actually was a partnership with the, with the county um, yeah. school board. So that's county school board land. And so you could see kind of a, a, a similarity between maybe the CRA doing something like that as, as the county did. So I, I don't know how long that lease runs, um, but I know that the kind of the model that Meacham approached or, or uh, the, the way they were able to, to secure that uh, contract um, was, was offering the EBT and, and working with... Um, Encore next door and offering uh, their their uh, food at a, at a rate that was affordable um, to those residents. I do want to also mention um, one of the asks that Monica made today was the council supporting uh, staff for uh, the Homegrown Hillsboro program. And if I can just take one moment and introduce you to Kayla Caselli, who is the new sustainability coordinator. She started with the city three weeks ago, and her passion is food, and she'll be working uh, with my office on these types of programs. So. Uh, she's a graduate of University of Florida and Patel College of Global Sustainability and uh, is just uh, super, super smart on these food issues. And she'll be uh, working closely with Monica uh, as, as, it, as necessary. So um, you can just yeah. say hi. 
<laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be working on this project, food systems and all things uh, sustainability with the city. Thank you. Welcome Thanks. aboard. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Councilwoman Hershey. So then you just moved here from Gainesville or in that area. So you you were you were there. So when I think of for, um, farms and urban agriculture, I often think of the farmers markets that Gainesville's been doing forever. Mm -hmm. And its own local grocery store, Wards, which actually buys <coughs> fruits and vegetables from gardeners in the area. And so that talking about, um, you had mentioned that earlier and I was thinking, that reminds me of, of, of that store and how we could possibly even do something like that and encourage that uh, here. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of great examples um, probably within the state and the rest of the country. And so I think, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but just see what's what's worked really well and apply it here. Good. I'm glad you said that. When you go to uh, Manatee County and if you get off as 276, I believe, and you drive down, I can't remember the name of the store, but it's an independent store. It's like a farmer's market, but it's a grocery store, too, and it's packed all the time as you're entering into Palmetto City Limits, just where you get into Palmetto City Limits. I've been there a couple of times, been to some friends in that area of town, and I've been in that store. So uh, when you talk about these independents or markets like that you're talking about, they do work. Uh, and and I, I tell you, they're, they're pretty much packed. You're like your major public or whatever. They're, they're pretty much packed every day. So I think that's an idea we should start looking at how we can find property and talking to these other people, see how they did it. Not reinvent the wheel, but see how they're doing mm -hmm. it to bring the wheel here. I just want to make one more comment. We've talked about Meacham a lot today. Um, Meacham was a $1 million project to get going. So as we talk about having more Meachams, that's kind of the starting price tag I think we can think about. Greenhouses, equipment, um, and then additionally, their operational costs, their labor. Um, I'm pretty sure the farmers are not getting paid a livable wage. I don't think they take vacations. I don't know what kind of health care they have. So when we talk about creating jobs for food systems and for farming, we also need to talk about is it a is it on the more gimmick side or is it on the more long-term sustainable truly you know a career kind of deal so all of this can be discussed in many 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 hours more of detail i'd be happy to do it um but yeah i just heard meacham a lot today it's a wonderful example i hope we have dozens more meachams throughout the city starting t price tags usually around a million and then you got to keep paying they have five staff members that work full-time Along that line, did sorry if I missed this earlier, but does the county give you a budget? Yeah, I'm a staff member. But oh, oh for, for my program. Yeah. Um, so we were able to leverage some of the ARP um, funds from uh, back in the pandemic. Um, and so this summer, we'll start also uh, hoping to advocate for more uh funding for the position. So the original funding from the ARP is funding the initial um, Homegrown Hillsboro like implementation. So that's hiring four part-time interns and their entire job is to go set up meetings with stakeholders that want to be part of food system work. And that's very, very large and varied and that's on purpose. Um, and so they'll be doing that starting in June and through the rest of the year. So if any of you would like to be interviewed, if you have any businesses that you think would fit into this, it doesn't have to be a traditional food system um, a stakeholder. It can be a law firm that wants to help educate their, their employees or help fund a community garden or help provide legal services to get through the land use stuff. So anybody in the county can play a role in this food system development. This next year, we're going to go start doing those interviews, and that's what our initial funding is supporting. Is how much was it, and how much do you think you're going to have in the next year? Just we were able to get two hundred thousand dollars for two years, um, and so uh, we, we had four hundred thousand dollars for this project. Um, we're hoping that we can maintain that, but that is of course up to. Um, Does the county have other buckets that they can use to help um, subsidize farms? Um, maybe um, it's just a kind of a matter of how the community wants to approach it. Um, so yeah, there's lots of tools. Um, the county does have a lot of assets that can be leveraged. Um, so there, there's a lot to be discovered. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Moran. I just want to know: Have you done any studies I'm not at sorry, all in your your office and regarding the investment, the, the, what you have to hire part time or whatever you're talking about, 
and what's the return on the product that you're distributing to the public? So it hasn't been done yet. We, we are just starting this process. We have just finished hiring these interns and actually training starts next week. Now that would be the key to everything. Yeah, yeah, and I, I have a master's in food systems and so it's applied economics degree and so I'm very familiar with like making sure every dollar that goes in has a dollar on the other side, hopefully several That's what more. I'd like to see all of that. Thank you. Yeah, for great. Me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, what I sense on this council is obviously like a commitment that would be very robust to making something like this happen. And I mean, for me, this is the, the, the role of government. I mean, you look at, um, it's the, the basic idea that there's places in, in within the city of Tampa, places like Sulphur Springs, places like East Tampa and others that, that, that are whatever you want to call it, food deserts where there's a lot of hunger, et cetera, et cetera. And, and government should intervene to right that wrong. You know, we do that, for example, there are parts, for example, I live in New Tampa. We have a lot of parks that are private parks, um, right? Par other parts of the city don't have parks that are private parks. So guess what? Government intervenes to make sure that kids have a place to play mm -hmm. in parts like East Tampa, Sulphur Springs, West Tampa, Ybor City, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we intervene in that regard. You take a look at a, a lot of different policies where government does that, and we should do that here. The varying level of involvement, I mean, uh, again, a community not having a, a or a, a, a dignified place to shop at for food it is a sign of disrespect to that community. And we should intervene by, by every means that we have. And if it costs a million bucks, I'm all for that. Because we would, I, again, if I didn't have that in my community, I'd be really ticked off mm -hmm. and, and I'd want it. And we should do that. So again, a, any motion that would be made, I know Councilman Goons has, has uh, done so much work on this, including back when he was in the CAC before council. I'll be glad to support because we got to move this forward. If it costs a million bucks, bring it on because I think it's the right thing to do. Great. Thank you. Well, hopefully we'll have many more conversations. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Rimmer, I, I need to thank you personally and recognize you on your help with the Resiliency Summit coming up the first week of May uh, with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning uh, Commission. Council, excuse me. Uh, you, you put forth a lot of effort, and, and I know it was tough, but I thank you very, very much for having Tampa involved with that Resiliency Summit. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We are adjourned till 1.30. Recess. Recess. Until recess until 1.30.
there's one thing that unites and sustains all living things on Earth. Water. We need it to survive as individuals, as neighborhoods, as a city. Yet we sometimes take our water for granted without thinking about where it comes from, how it gets to us, or what's been done in the past to ensure that we have water today. For Tampa to understand how and where we get our water from, we have to know about the dam. straddling the Hillsborough River at Rowlett Park near the Rogers Park Golf Course. The dam helps ensure that the city's demand for nearly 80 million gallons of water a day is met. But that hasn't always been the case. When the dam was first conceived in the late 1800s, it had nothing to do with supplying water for Tampa. Situated at the outskirts of Tampa, accessible only on foot, by horseback, or by a horse-drawn wagon, the dam has withstood fires, bandits, bombs, undercover agents, floods, and today the dam stands near its original site with a story that coincides with a story of Tampa's growth and development as Tampa has grown around it. As late as 1870, only about 700 people were living in Tampa. There was little in the way of commerce in the area. Agriculture and cattle raising rule the day. Tampa was an assemblage of wood-framed structures, sandy streets, and Florida crackers. Those were cattlemen who got their names from the sound their whips made when they were cracked in the air to drive the cattle and the oxen forward. But that was all about to change. Three events occurred almost simultaneously that began to transform Tampa and the surrounding area. The first took place in 1881 when a captain in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers discovered phosphate pebbles in the Peace River. Phosphate, a precious commodity then and today, increases crop growth and yield. Its discovery near Tampa ignited a phosphate boom that led to nearly 200 companies mining the region by the late 1890s. The second significant event occurred in 1884 when Henry B. Plant completed the last segment of track that brought his railroad to Tampa. Almost overnight, Tampa had rail service to Sanford, then Jacksonville, and ultimately the entire eastern seaboard and points beyond. Plant was so taken by the economic prospects in Tampa, he decided to construct a magnificent hotel on the banks of the Hillsborough River and to develop a deep water port at the southwestern tip of the Interbay Peninsula. Tampa no longer was isolated and no longer dependent on agriculture and cattle raising as economic drivers. With the arrival of the trains came the third major change agent, new entrepreneurs, including Ignacio Aya and Vicente Martinez Ibor two successful cigar manufacturers from Cuba. Enticed by the train service available out of Tampa, Haya and Martina Sibor also coveted Tampa's climate. The new deep water port and Tampa's proximity to Cuba, where the tobacco leaf was harvested and there was an available pool of skilled workers. With a growing population and new industries, Martina Sibor, among others, realized that both industry and workers needed a convenient, reliable way to move between commercial centers. In 1886, that need was met when a steam-driven streetcar line was built between what we now refer to as downtown and Ybor City, an emerging cigar manufacturing center. Soon, a second line was constructed between Ybor City and the bedroom community of Palmetto Beach. This line, unlike the first, was financed by individuals who had no connection to Tampa's growing cigar industry. A few years later, in 1892, Tampa Suburban announced plans to build a third streetcar network that would encompass most, if not all, of the then existing neighborhoods in Tampa. The development of that third streetcar line was followed by conflict. The investors of the first line protested, holding that they had sole rights to construct streetcar lines throughout the city. Their arguments convinced a judge to issue an injunction prohibiting Tampa Suburban from constructing any lines until the matter could be settled in court. In response, the investors of Tampa Suburban 
went around the injunction by forming a new entity, the Consumers Electric Light and Street Railway Company. Consumers Electric, which promptly proceeded to build streetcar lines all over Tampa to service their growing streetcar operations and the street lights that were starting to light up the city, Consumers Electric purchased a water power plant situated on the Hillsborough River. The power plant, which consisted of a timber crib dam and a wooden powerhouse, was built originally to operate a sawmill. Consumers Electric began using it to generate hydroelectric power. The demand for electricity quickly outstripped the plant's capacity, so Consumers Electric purchased a new site downstream and, in 1896, began constructing a new dam and power station. This site downstream of the original power plant is where Tampa's current dam remains, placing it among the oldest and most important structures in the city of Tampa. The dam, completed in 1897, was constructed using logs and a technique referred to as cribbing. It included a 120-foot long spillway with a control gate on the north end and an earthen embankment in the back. The hydropower facilities and oil-fired steam generating unit were housed in a large wooden frame structure at the south end of the new dam. Following its completion, the new hydroelectric power plant operated as intended for about a year. Then early in the evening on December 13, 1898, the dam was partially destroyed by a huge explosion. It was suspected that local cattlemen and disgruntled landowners were behind the attack. The somewhat dormant pool of water held back by the dam covered some of the land previously used for grazing and at the same time attracted scores of mosquitoes. Although the link between mosquitoes and yellow fever had not been established at the time, locals believed that the mosquitoes made the environment unsafe for their families. There's evidence that Consumers Electric compensated the landowners for the loss of pastures for grazing, but an effective way to handle the mosquitoes did not exist. The local press called the attack on the dam the most cowardly crime ever committed in the city or the county. An editorial written shortly after that headline decried that the people opposing the presence of the dam were actuated by a spirit of revenge and that their purpose seems to be to block the wheels of progress regardless of the best interests of the community. A $2,500 reward, that would be about $72,000 in today's dollars, was offered for the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the explosion. Four men were arrested and tried the following year. However, for reasons that remain unclear in the documentation, the presiding judge issued a directed verdict of acquittal. The prosecutor for the state was Peter O. Knight, a consumer's electric investor and the man who eventually became president of the Tampa Electric Company, a position he held for 22 years. Whatever the saboteur's motivations, their move to damage the dam proved to be devastating to Consumers Electric. The high cost of building the infrastructure for the streetcar systems, coupled with lower than expected revenues that resulted from a rate war between competing streetcar lines and the cost of repairing the damage to the dam proved to be too much. Consumers Electric went bankrupt. Their assets, including the dam, were purchased by a new company the Tampa Electric Company, TECO, financed jointly by Stone & Webster, an engineering services company out of Massachusetts, and several prominent Tampa locals. As Tampa continued to grow, TECO maintained and operated the dam and power generating facilities on the Hillsborough River for nearly 20 years until the summer of 1916. On June 28, 1916, the dam tender was making his usual rounds when he observed two men at the north end of the dam. When he called out to them, they quickly got into a waiting boat and paddled away. Approaching the gate, he heard what he later described as a muffled explosion under the water, accompanied by a small amount of smoke and gases that smelled like sulfur. The explosion did not cause any damage to the dam. Since the company had not received any complaints about the dam for a number of years, the motive for the attack is unknown. For safety, Tico added a watchman to guard the facility at night. The added security helped for a couple of months and all remained quiet. 
And then on August 17th, a much more ominous incident unfolded. At about 1 a.m., the dam tender and the night watchman were taken hostage at gunpoint by about 20 masked men. The power station was set afire. The watchman told the intruders that unless he arrived at his nearby home at his usual time, his wife was sure to sound an alarm. The kidnappers released him, but threatened to kill him if he alerted anyone. He ignored their threat, and once released, immediately went to waken the chief engineer, who went directly to the power station to put out the fire. And meanwhile, the dam operator, still captive, heard a whistle in the distant night air. One of his captors returned the whistle and then released the operator with instructions that he should go home. The intruders then quickly disappeared into the night. The just released dam operator ignored his captors too and stayed to help extinguish the fire before heading home. When he got there, he discovered that the telephone wire to his house had been cut. He then went by horseback to a nearby general store to place a call to his superiors to alert them of the problem. By daybreak, the dam and power station were surrounded by TECO officials and local law enforcement. While inspecting the site, they discovered a large wooden box containing 196 sticks of dynamite tied to four fuses. Three of the fuses fizzled out shortly after being lit. The fourth had burned a bit long, burning down to only a few inches shy of the dynamite-filled box before it fizzled out too. Investigators surmised that the distant whistle the operator heard was signaling the operator's captors that the fuses were lit and they should leave. Following the initial on-scene gathering of evidence, Tico hired the famed Pinkerton Detective Agency to conduct an investigation. And on August 20th, a Pinkerton representative wrote from the company's Atlanta office. Regarding the recent case, we'll have a man ready to send forward within a few days. Of course, you know that we'll have to make a careful selection and we'll have to detail a man who has plenty of grit. And we are now proceeding to make a good man available. Now concerning devices so that we can exchange telegrams without 